strengthen Europe's economic and monetary union further, which is organized by the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, as our contribution to the Conference on the Future of Europe. The Conference on the Future of Europe, launched by the European Parliament, the European Commission and the Council last year, is a unique opportunity to foster the public de debate on Europe's challenges and priorities a debate to which also the EU institutions have been invited to contribute by providing their ideas and recommendations on key topics, such as a strong economy. This is why we are here today with the support of our distinguished speakers coming from institutions and academia. The ESM would like to provide its contribution to the discussion on how to strengthen more the economic and monetary union in Europe. The conference will have two panels. The first one will focus on the progress made by the euro area on the EMU deepening agenda since the sovereign debt crisis and the recent developments in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. The second panel will focus more specifically on risk sharing mechanism in the euro area. First, by giving a picture of the current state and then discussing possible future avenues to enhance it. Before we begin, let me briefly explain just a few rules. This event is public and will be recorded. Second, participants can make questions through the chat function and the questions will be read by the panelists and the chair who will uh, sum up the questions and ask each other and give answers. Without further ado, let me now invite Klaus Reiklin, the Managing Director of the European Stability Mechanism, to deliver his keynote speech. Klaus, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nicola, and good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all who are um, now linked to this seminar, to this um, conference, um, which, as Nicola said, represents the ESM's contribution to the conference on the future of Europe. The discussion on the future of Europe and our economic and monetary union is timely as we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the introdu introduction of Euro bank notes and coins. Even though the Euro is still a young currency, it became quickly the world's second most important currency. And today, over 340 million European citizens use it every day across 19 countries. And with 78% of citizens supporting it, the Euro's popularity is at a historic high. The last 20 years have also been a test of strength for the Euro. During the last two decades, the euro had to face numerous challenges, most notably the global financial crisis and the euro crisis. Member states responded forcefully to these crises, and this also holds true for the latest major shock, the COVID-19 pandemic. A combination of existing instruments and new tools allowed the EU and the Euro area to weather also this crisis. Now is a good moment to take stock of how far we have come, but also define a future agenda on what remains to be done. Let me first look briefly at the progress made so far. Although the different crises we experienced were challenges for the euro indeed, they were at least not wasted. They led to further progress on deepening EMU. The global financial crisis and the euro crisis spurred the launch of banking union, which notably brought the supervision of the most important financial institutions to the European level. The crisis also triggered the creation of a clear legislative framework for failing banks with the aim to protect taxpayers' money. 
the euro crisis also filled an institutional gap in the initial architecture of AMU. The temporary EFSF and the permanent ESM became the land of last resort for sovereigns in the euro area. Importantly, this also brought more risk sharing within AMU. More recently, the pandemic triggered a powerful European response to the economic consequences of COVID-19. The crisis response was well coordinated at both the national and the European level. Countries that suffered most from the pandemic received more financial assistance. This is in the interest of all members of the single market and the monetary union and again strengthens risk sharing. Additionally, the experience gained in setting up the EFSF and ESM a decade ago was also very useful for creating the next generation EU recovery fund by the European Commission. As we now gradually emerge from the pandemic, it is important to reflect on how the agenda on deepening AMU further can be advanced <clears throat> and how we see the future of Europe. After all, the conferences on the future of Europe shall enable people across Europe to share their ideas and help shape our common future. In this context, it's worth recalling some proposals already made back in 2015 by the so-called Five Presidents Report. I'm referring to the idea of increasing risk sharing in the euro area through the creation of a fiscal stabilization function and the integration of the ESM into the EU legal framework. In my view, those proposals are very relevant to foster the resilience of AMU, and that's why they will be central in this conference. Let me start by asking, why do we need more risk sharing in the euro area? Risk sharing in the euro area is the sum of mechanisms through which a shock a positive or a negative shock to a country's economy is transmitted to other member states. Risk sharing supports convergence, avoids fragmentation, and helps smooth business cycles. <clears throat> Compared to the United States, economic risk sharing between the member states of the euro area is relatively small. Shocks in the US are shared to a much larger degree than shocks in the euro area. The same is true inside large euro area countries like France or Germany, where risk sharing naturally is much better developed than in the euro area overall. It is estimated that 80% of local shocks remain unsmoothened in the euro area compared to only 20% inside the US. As a result, and compared to the US, business cycles diverge more in Europe and fragmentation is a bigger risk. Risk sharing takes place through two channels, the public or fiscal channel and the private or market channel. Within countries, whether the US, France, or Germany, significant risk sharing takes place through a common tax and social security system. That cannot be replicated in AMU in the foreseeable future. Therefore, risk sharing via markets is particularly important for the euro area. The more risk is shared through banks and markets, the fewer fiscal mechanisms are needed on the public side. As progress on banking union and capital markets union is slow, unfortunately, 
I will focus my remarks on fiscal mechanisms. In the EU, public risk sharing has happened for decades via the EU budget, lending by the European Investment Bank, the EIB, and more recently through the financial support provided by the ESM and EFSF. A common budget for financing common public goods, for instance, a common defense budget financed by common taxes, would be one way to enhance macroeconomic stabilization in case of shocks. But that is not realistic in the near term. Another way to strengthen public sector risk sharing inside the euro area would be a central fiscal capacity for macroeconomic stabilization. In the monetary union, the exchange rate and monetary policy cannot be used to respond to country specific shocks. There is one common monetary policy for all member states. Consequently, fiscal policy is the only macroeconomic policy instrument available to respond to country specific shocks. A euro area fiscal stabilization function could make additional financial resources available to countries hit by a sizable external shock if the national fiscal space turns out to be insufficient. The pandemic has increase the urgency of establishing a central fiscal capacity. Considering the huge fiscal support in the last two years, some member states of the euro area may struggle to use their own national fiscal policy to respond to a new shock in the near future in light of high public debt. And looking beyond the short term, Large asymmetric shocks could become more common if the occurrence of extreme natural events increases because of climate change. Next Generation EU was an efficient response to the pandemic. However, it is temporary in nature. It was appropriately designed for all EU countries and not just the euro area. And it is not predominantly an instrument for macroeconomic stabilization purposes. It promotes structural reforms and provides financing irrespective of the position in the business cycle. For euro area members, it is worth analyzing other instruments, in particular, a permanent fiscal stabilization mechanism. Several proposals have been put forward, and they would all help to strengthen risk sharing. They include reinsurance of national unemployment funds, rainy day funds, and revolving funds, and that would include an ESM facility. They could all be designed to provide loans or grants or both. Although grants may have a stronger stabilization effect, they could imply, imply moral hazard concerns and, importantly, would require regular contributions from the budgets of member states. Facilities based on low interest rate loans are easier to set up. The ESM could provide such a revolving fund that would provide loans to member states in difficult economic situations. The ESM could draw on its existing lending capacity. No additional taxpayer money would be needed. In addition, the ESM could use its experience with sovereign lending. The different proposals made are not necessarily mutually exclusive. A revolving fund hosted by the ESM could complement other fiscal stabilization instruments. Proposals for increasing risk sharing, including through a euro area fiscal stabilization facility, through banking union and a capital markets union, 
are today all controversial among our member states. But they are important to promote the resilience of the euro area as well as convergence between countries. Progress on risk sharing would also strengthen the international role of the euro. Therefore, work on the different ways to share risk continues in the relevant fora like the euro area. And you will discuss risk sharing in more detail in session two. Let me conclude with a few thoughts on the second proposals in the five presidents report and look at the possible integration of the ESM into the EU legal framework. As you know, the ESM is an intergovernmental institution based on international treaty. This setup was unavoidable given the need to respond rapidly to the euro crisis. And it has worked well in practice with excellent cooperation with our peer institutions, in particular, the European Commission during programs and also during post-program monitoring. The ESM's current governance arrangement is endowed with a democratic legitimacy from the national level. The ESM founding document was signed by the governments of the euro area countries and ratified in all parliaments. The Board of Governors, the ESM's highest decision-making body, consists of 19 finance ministers of the euro area countries who are accountable to their national parliaments. The capital behind the ESM, more than 700 billion euro, and therefore the risks taken by the ESM are ultimately risks for national budgets. Yet, integrating the ESM into the legal framework could bring the ESM mandate closer to the economic and fiscal policy coordination framework in Europe and cooperation with EU institutions would become easier and more consistent. A good model for the ESM inside the EU treaty framework would be the European Investment Bank, which has its own protocol in the EU treaty. The EIB has similarities with the ESM. It has its own capital, a governance structure with strong involvement of member states, and is, like the ESM, active in financial markets. This model offers the best guarantee in terms of legal certainty compared to other alternatives proposed in recent years, including the proposal to use secondary legislation for the integration of the ESM into the EU treaty. We believe that an integration should only be considered when the EU primary law is changed which means at the next opportunity when the EU treaties are reopened as part of a broader agenda, which might be one of the results of the Conference on the Future of Europe. These conferences on the Future of Europe are really an excellent opportunity for us, for citizens, to present our vision on the different aspects of Europe and to build a future together. I hope the conference this afternoon, organized by ESM colleagues, can make a good contribution to this process. And I wish you a fruitful dialogue on the future of Europe with our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus, for, for your speech. As you said, it's now a good moment to take stock of how far we have come uh, on EMU deepening and also to define a future agenda on what uh, remains to be done. So with this in mind, uh, I'm pleased to chair the first panel, 
which uh, will focus on the MU deepening agenda in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. I, I would invite uh, the four panelists uh, to join uh, uh, via video and audio. I can briefly introduce them. We have with us today <coughs> Jean-Pierre Vidal, who is Chief Economic Advisor to the European Council President uh, Charles Michel. We also have uh, Reinhard Felke, who is Director of Policy Coordination, Economic Forecasts and Communication at the DG ECFIN, the European Commission. Then we have uh, Maria De Merzis, Deputy Director of Bruegel. And finally, last but not least, we have Marion Salinas, who is Deputy Head of Policy Strategy and Institutional Relations at the ESM. Um, I would start uh, the first round of intervention with, with Jean-Pierre Vidal. I think Jean-Pierre in the Council has a, a broad view of the EU agenda. So what I would ask Jean-Pierre is to, to, to speak a few minutes on how the process of deepening EMU fits in the broader EU agenda, also looking at the challenges side of us uh, uh, in the current uh, circumstances. Jean-Pierre, welcome again, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola, and good afternoon to everyone. So, you know, I will I will start with our first observation, which is that integration, um, in particular, I mean, monetary integration is that an integral part of the process of EU integration. And we all know that uh, it started, you know, as uh, an indispensable step uh, to take forward the single market. That is our main asset, certainly, and which was very much undermined by monetary disorders in the 70s and 18s. Some of us, I mean, have lived through these disorders, and I think, I mean, we, we still have some memories of the situation of Europe back then. But it was also a strong, uh, an expression of a strong commitment by member states to European integration following um, German reunification. So it also has a geopolitical dimension. Ten years ago, as has been very well highlighted by, by Klaus in his, in his speech, monetary union was really at the top of the political agenda, but it was for a reason that was, I mean, in fact, in a sense, a sad reason, which was a sovereign debt crisis that led to a very significant strengthening of our institutional framework with the creation of your institutions, ESM, and also with the transfer of competence, for example, of banking supervision to the union level. Ten years ago, or even before, many people, I mean, many economists were kind of, predict, well, kind of predicting or assuming that monetary union will not last forever. And what happened exactly, I mean, when the crisis hit is that there was, again, a very clear expression of political will, political commitment to European integration. And in fact, political will prevailed over all prediction of euro area breakups. The marking, I mean, the, the most important moment for me of this process was the 2012, the June 2012 European Council meeting, when leaders actually decided in particular to, uh, to, to move the competency for banking supervision to union level and to assign it to the European Central Bank. This was a very, very important political down payment to European integration. And in fact, it created the political condition for the ECB later on to do whatever it takes and to embark on, on, uh, on, on a, a new uh, Policy, policy direction with, with, uh, with uh, uh, the asset uh, purchase program. Now, over the past 10 years, the political agenda has evolved. And what makes the political agenda evolve? Again, often these are crises, right? Crises and new uh, political or geopolitical challenges that emerge along, along our journey. So, for example, climate has really become an emergency today. It was not really the case 10 years ago. It was not so prominent. The digital transformation, now it's you know, part of our everyday life, and then there are very significant, significant challenges and even risk of the union to be left behind. So this digital agenda is also very much at the forefront of the, of the political agenda today. We had migration. We had Brexit also along our journey, 
and most recently we had these uh, these uh, these um, these concern of resilience in particular with the you know the visibility of strategic dependencies that that came in particular during the covid-19 crisis but what is important to keep in mind is that monetary union remains instrumental to meeting all those ge geopolitical challenges for instance the euro is a global currency and of course it's a key asset for our strategic autonomy and our competitiveness it's also the currency that uh, is a currency to to fund to fund the climate transition and banking union and capital markets union that are so essential to monetary integration in fact are also essential to to the cross model uh, of the european union and we know we have massive investment needs and we know we ne will need also to support innovation in europe so if i had conclude on what will be you know kind of uh, the main point on the political agenda over the next three years i will take maybe you know four points only well, the first one is financial integration. So basically the completion of banking union and the deepening of capital markets union. There, it's a long process. It's true. I mean, it started, uh, you know, many, many years ago, banking union 10 years ago. But we should not, we should make no mistake there. The fundamental steps in this process have already been, been made, in fact, 10 years ago and relatively rapidly, you know, with, uh, with uh, the city knocker of, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of um, for example, of the single supervisory mechanism. It remains important for the single market and for the financing economy and therefore is there to stay on the, on the political agenda. And work is going on. There is commitment. There is full political support by EU leaders consistently expressed in Euro summits. So now, I mean, the ministers in the Eurogroup, I mean, are developing a work plan. And then from this work plan, they will take forward the different work streams that are needed to complete, uh, in particular, banking union. Capital market union is a more complex and, I mean, having many, many elements. And that, I mean, so progress will, will, will happen over time, but not as a kind of, uh, it's more, I mean, it's ongoing work, in fact. The second point is the digital euro. So digital euro is also something that has emerged as a, a, a hot topic on the political agenda. I just reflect to my view the overwhelming digitalization of our economies and that overwhelming digitalization of our economies and the fact that, you know, in economic transa transaction, you know, tr uh, economic transactions themselves are increasingly digitalized as elicited a political interest that I, in fact, uh, was was really i mean um in a sense surprising for such a technical issue and it's something that also happens i would say in other in other in other large uh, large monetary um, uh, monetary unions then economic governance that is also uh, a linchpin of of monetary union then we also have a process ongoing which is a review of the of the framework we know that it's not it's not easy it's uh, typically, I mean, there is a long tradition of division and a debate between member states, but there is a process going on. And, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with time, I mean, over the course of the year, I do expect that um, consensus will, will, will be built on this uh, as well. And then there is a longer term debate that was alluded to by, by Klaus, which is all this debate related to fiscal capacity. There, I think we have made, in fact, a lot of progress over the past 10, 10, 15 years in the sense that there is, I think, a quite clear good and good understanding of the economic rationale. And what remains to be done, and I, I would say is, in fact, already being done or has started to, 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 be, to, be, to be done, is to work more on the politics of it, the institutional, you know, the institutional setup that could underpin new mechanism. Of course, we have a good example of a possible, I mean, a possible avenue with the recovery and resilience facility. But as I was highlighted by, by close, it's, I think it's partly a different logic. It's mostly based on cohesion policies in the union budget. And we know the union budget also is an investment budget. So there are kind of, uh, we will have to decide exactly in which direction to go there, but further work certainly is needed. So 
I think, uh, just to conclude, I think we should not forget what has been achieved because a lot has been achieved. And on this basis, we should for look forward with confidence to the next step in, uh, in, EMU, in, in EMU deepening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. I think in, in 10 minutes, you were able to give a full picture of uh, how the political agenda has evolved uh, in the European Union. Also, you touch upon the ge geopolitical dimension of this agenda. And also, I think you outline uh, four uh, top priorities for the next three years. Thank you very much. I, I would I would now give the floor to, to, to Rainer, Rainer Felke, uh, from uh, the European Commission. And what I would ask uh, Reiner to talk about is maybe to zoom in a little bit on the uh, uh, economic and monetary union deepening. What kind of initiatives and what kind uh, of uh, future initiative uh, uh, we we have in, in our uh, on our table? And uh, uh, maybe he will talk also about what is the Commission point of view on that. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and uh, and happy new year. And many thanks for inviting me. I'm I'm very happy about your conference and the opportunity to being with you this afternoon in a context of the conference of the future of Europe. And uh, indeed, as you say, our ongoing review of the economic governance and the fiscal rules. It is uh, timely and relevant to reflect on the experience also of the COVID crisis and what this experience means for our deepening of EMU agenda. It is almost two years now that our days are packed with crisis management, including the creation organization now with the implementation of the recovery and resilience facility that uh, both Klaus and uh, Jean-Pierre mentioned. And uh, your invitation gives a welcome reason to pause and to reflect. Now, my message for this afternoon is very simple. First, COVID presented a shock like no other. Second, our policy response has been different. And third, and this is perhaps not surprisingly then, also the results of our policies have been different. And let me briefly then elaborate on these three differences and conclude with some reflections on the implications for the future of EMU. And maybe I should stress already from, uh, from here, this will be um, you know, not necessarily official commission um, positions on this, but, uh, but some, some stenographic pointers on my side. So first, the nature of the pandemic shock. It's very different from the global financial crisis that, uh, that, that, that Klaus mentioned at the beginning. And uh, compared to earlier episodes of economic stress in the history of the euro area, in particular the global financial crisis, with COVID, we experienced or are still experiencing a rather unique kind of shock. Economically speaking, this has been an exogenous and symmetric shock stemming from a health emergency that has simultaneously affected the global economy as much as it has affected the euro area economy. Both supply and demand, as we know, almost stalled at the beginning, sending our economies in tailspin. The depth of the economic contraction caused by the pandemic was unprecedented in the history of European integration. The impact was somewhat asymmetric across member state economies in terms of timing, dynamics and intensity, which was largely owed to the speed of the spreading of the virus, the structural setup and composition of the economies, and the restrictiveness of measures needed to stem contagion. But the pandemic hit the euro area economy like a natural disaster. Nobody was to blame. Nobody had an immediate cure and all felt sitting in the same boat. The sad pictures of Bergamo in winter 2020 did three things. They drove home the seriousness of the crisis they nourished the concern, if not the fear, about what happens in Italy and, else, and elsewhere today may happen to us tomorrow. But they also sparked a wave of solidarity across Europe. Governments' helpless attempts to protect their population from contagion by closing borders were short-lived episodes. And faced with the reality of a rapidly spreading pandemic, the calls for cooperation across Europe eventually succeeded. So images and emotions matter, and together with the exogenous character of the shock, helped to create a common narrative, which paved the way for a common European policy response. Here is an important difference, I think, from the situation of some, some 10 years ago. And our policy response was different indeed, and this is my second point. Compared to the financial crisis, 
Europe's policy response was swift, bold, and well-coordinated. Um, Klaus made the point at the beginning, both at national and EU level. And we had learned from the experience of the financial crisis some 10 years before. We activated the escape clause to give member states the legal space to act. The ECB took resolute steps to provide liquidity and support favorable financing conditions for households, business, and banks. In early April, the Eurogroup put forward three safety nets worth of a total of 540 billion designed with QR business, um, with, uh, with uh, the guarantee schemes and invest EU fund and the sovereigns with the ESM's pandemic uh, crisis support instrument. And a few weeks later, only member states agreed on the debt finance recovery and resilience fund with roughly half of the, of the volume um, <clears throat> in form of grants, a novelty of unprecedented scale at the European level. The measures, both in terms of financing and the scale of support were designed with a view to prevent the fragmentation of European financial capital uh, markets, which had proved so damaging during the financial crisis. They were designed with the objective to provide support where it was most needed and with the objectives in mind to minimize scarring and to promote convergence rather than divergence across member states. Institutionally and politically important to mention, the key measures of next generation EU <clears throat> were established um, on the basis of existing EU budget methods and decided by the European legislators along the familiar community processes. There was no need and no desire to mobilize intergovernmental constructions. I should add that by and large, the measures were not euro area specific, but overall they proved rather beneficial for the integrity and functioning of EMU. The decision to finance next generation EU via the issuance of EU debt sent a strong signal of unity to the markets and provided welcome breathing space for fiscally constrained member states. The measures struck a good balance also between short-term macroeconomic stabilization and providing support to longer-term supply side reforms. To complete the picture on the policy response, we must not forget the common EU strategy for the procurement and supply of vaccines. My third point, the result was different. Thanks to the timely and uh, well-coordinated policy response, the euro area has avoided financial fragmentation, contained the impact on employment, and experienced a much faster recovery than during the global financial crisis. Progress made in previous years in the areas of banking union and bank balance sheet repair had increased the resilience of the euro area. The credit channel remained open, and in this crisis, banks were not the problem, they were the solution, a part of it of the solution. The immediate stabilization effect ran through confidence that was created by Europe's resolve to act together, and the availability of the ESM's pandemic crisis support played its role here too. Sure, supported the stabilization of employment, and in some member states prompted institutional reforms that will increase the resilience of their labor markets also in a more lasting manner. The RRF, just to mention, is a very unique multi-annual program expected to contribute to investments and reforms with a lasting impact. Many member states, in particular those where challenges and vulnerabilities are high, have put forward comprehensive and ambitious reform plans tackling long-standing structural challenges in a wide range of areas such as labor markets, education, justice, administrative efficiency, and others. And equally important, in a context of economic uncertainty and strained national finances, um, it, it gives member states the necessary breathing space to maintain and pursue future-oriented public investment. While it builds on country-specific recommendations, identifying reform areas, it is an exercise driven by the member states who retain full ownership of the reforms and investments they are proposing. The successful launch of the RF has further strengthened confidence with markets and, important for the functioning of EMU, has also boosted trust among member states and vis-a-vis -vis the institutions. It is good news when we hear that the Italian RRP is a source of inspiration for the new Dutch government in the design of their forthcoming plan. So what lessons can we draw 
from the experience with the COVID crisis management for our deepening of EMU agenda. Admittedly, some aspects are clearer to me, others much less so. So let me conclude with, uh, as, I, as I initially said, some personal and non-exhaustive pointers in stenographic manner. First, once again, it was a crisis that prompted progress. The EU has demonstrated its ability to act when needed, which carries the confidence enhancing promise, we can do it again if necessary. Let's not forget, as Klaus um, also emphasized, the RF is of a temporary nature. Second, the EU legal framework proved to be the preferred framework to work with. Member states felt more comfortable to work within this familiar framework where the institutional roles are clear and transparent, uh, transparently assigned to the respective co-legislators. Third, the approach taken was an EU-wide approach rather than euro area specific. This is perhaps not, not surprising in a context where after breakfast, uh, Brexit, the euro area represents more than 85% of EU GDP. And the prospect of new euro area euro accessions will further blur the lines between the EU and the euro area in the coming years. Fourth, progress in the area of integration is best promoted by concrete and tangible arguments. The protection of health and the promotion of concrete climate objectives and projects gained more political traction than abstract discussions about a central fiscal stabilization capacity or a new area finance minister in the past. Fifth and almost end, um, trust among member states and in the commission is being restored. Okay, there is no objective way to measure such a thing as trust. But looking at the quality and ambition of RRPs and judging from the dialogues and the interactions with member states and the feedback from stakeholders inside and outside of the EU um, <clears throat> gives me a sense that I'm, um, that I'm getting that, uh, that this, this trust um, is being restored. And this makes me hopeful also with a view to the ongoing economic governance review. Institutional clarity is important but mutual trust is essential for cooperation. And the robustness of this trust will crucially depend on the progress with the implementation of the RRPs in the coming years. Final point, each crisis is different and requires a response that matches the challenge. The challenges of the financial and banking crisis some 10 years ago required a different approach than that of the pandemic in 2020. And the next crisis will present us with new unexpected features. However, the macroeconomic toolbox is limited and some of the challenges to, of today are not new and will be with us for some time. I'm thinking here of the high level of public debt in a number of countries and the need to organize a consistent and time <clears throat> and time consistent policy mix for the euro area, not only in crisis times, but also in good times. Looking ahead, I see the climate transition of our economies confronting us with a formidable policy task. And further progress on banking and capital market union, the French presidency speaks of a financing union, would be instrumental in this context as much as it could help uh, to make the EU EMU more resilient and uh, performing and improve risk sharing. I will stop here and uh, thanks a lot for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rainer. I think you made quite important points on the impact of the COVID crisis, the policy response and what would be the legacy. And I think you raised five very level, relevant points uh, on your personal remarks that uh, deserve quite a discussion. Uh, what we might discuss later is this euro area, EU dimension, for example, or trust or the legal framework. I think all of them uh, are very relevant. Um, I will give the floor in a second to Maria. Uh, I want to remind our participants, uh, uh, audience, that uh, they can ask questions to the panelists through the chat function. So after the, this round of remarks, we will uh, uh, collect uh, the, the questions. So Maria, thank you very much for joining from Bruegel. I think uh, uh, what would be useful from your corner is to, to have the, your own perspective and, and Bruegel perspective on uh, uh, the process of deepening EMU, maybe given uh, uh, the role of your institution, also putting this in, a, in, in, in the context of the recent and future global developments would be also very important for us. Uh, the floor is yours, Maria. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicola, and uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I can certainly give you my opinions. I don't know that I can reflect Bruegel opinions. There isn't such a thing. So I think I really speak uh, my, uh, on my own behalf here. Um, the good news about going third is that the previous speakers have been incredibly comprehensive in, in giving us basically all the input that we need for discussing uh, all of these uh, issues that uh, is the subject of the conference today. And lots of points that were given by the managed director and our previous speakers. Um, I basically have the portfolio of all the issues that I think are important for the discussion in the context of deepening and uh, risk sharing, which is the subject uh, of the next uh, panel. So perhaps what I would what I would do is uh, give you my own take in terms of what I believe are priorities, stemming from both both what we have done well and perhaps what we might not have done quite so well. Um, there is a lot of discussion uh, in uh, about the political will. Uh, to reform, and I, can, I keep reflecting on the fact that political will is not void of any uh, context. Political will emerges with circumstances, and that is actually, I think both speakers, uh, all, all three speakers actually have alluded to this issue. Um, the reaction to the pandemic crisis uh, uh, was very much uh, the result of political will, uh, which was, of course, itself the result of an a really extraordinary event that has that, that, that has. Uh, that has hit us. Uh, um, you know, somebody talked about that effect being a natural disaster, which of course it is in 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 some sense. Um, uh, but you know, if you compare the, com the 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 reaction to this crisis, the the policy reaction to this crisis, to the policy reaction of the financial crisis, we really see um, a, a number of interesting differences. I would argue that the need to have reacted in a coordinated fashion back in the financial crisis was just as big as it was in the pandemic crisis, but the political will to get there uh, wasn't quite uh, uh, quite what it ought to have been. Now, there is a lot to be said about the benefit of hindsight, and I think Reinhardt made this point very clearly that we've also learned from the reaction of the previous crisis. So there is an important premium that comes with, uh, with uh, learning. So in the second time round, you can do things better. And hopefully in the future, when we get crisis, which we will, uh, we are even better and quicker to coordinate uh, because the fact that we are in EMEO and in the single crisis implies that there is uh, interdependencies and, and I would argue that these interdependencies are only becoming stronger also in the context of global challenges that we face. So with that, three points that I want to make and uh, I'm picking all three uh, because I believe them to be very important. The first one is the quite the value of policy coordination uh, that that if you ask me what was the big success of this crisis by comparison to the next it was the ability to coordinate both fiscal and monetary uh, uh, policy, so a proper macroeconomic management with with policies that were totally aligned in terms of what they were aiming to achieve, and a coordination between fiscal policies themselves that stemmed from uh, uh, the removal of the rules, or the temporary removal, suspension of the rules, uh, with QE from the um, uh, from the central bank that allowed prevented financial fragmentation and allowed countries to tap the markets at reasonable prices. All of these were elements that allowed appropriate fiscal coordination between the countries themselves. So uh, if we are to, uh, to draw one lesson from this is that all policy design in the future needs to be done at a higher level that aims to align the objectives of macroeconomic uh, uh, management for any given shock. The, we had the same effect back in the financial crisis, but our policies were not coordinated. That led to delays, it led to mistakes, and only then uh, uh, did it uh, uh, did it allow us to uh, properly identify the institutions that needed to be created, but also how to better align uh, um, the management? And I dare say that back then uh, we're still aware in an, in, an, in, an, in a world where it was monetary policy that was uh, that was bearing the burden of adjustment where fiscal policy wasn't doing what it ought to have been doing, uh, given the shock that it has hit us. So uh, that's that's the, that's the first thing that I think we should really keep in mind for the next uh, shock that comes to us. 2022 is going to be the year where we uh, discuss uh, fiscal rules. Um, that's because these rules for a moment are not operational. They will be operation in a year from now. It's a good opportunity to discuss those. And, you know, coming from my first point, uh, in fact, the one thing that we need to think about as we are rethinking about the potential of reforming those rules is how to best achieve 
this coordination with monetary policy, but primarily because we're talking about the fiscal rules, how to achieve coordination between fiscal policy, national fiscal policies. There are the rationale that created those fiscal rules, namely the one of interdependencies, of spillovers between fiscal policy actions from one country to the other, that rationale is still there. In fact, it's even strengthening. So we need to impose, we need to come back to a set of fiscal rules, but they need to be properly designed in order to allow for policy coordination. Uh, the 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 big the big thing that we need in my view we need to keep in mind uh, while thinking about how to reform these rules is looking back uh, we observe two important things first of all fiscal policy became procyclical which has been a mistake um, and uh, actually the the one element of uh, fiscal policy that actually took a hit every time that needed to be cut was investment. This is not going to be enough uh, in the future. Uh, we are likely to see these types of shocks, dare I say two once in a lifetime shocks in the space of 15 years, that these are big shocks. So we are likely to see a greater need for fiscal policy in the, in the future. So there is going to be a huge role for active fiscal policy in the future. We better make sure that uh, fiscal policy implemented in one country does not have negative impact on, on other countries. Um, and of course, sustainability, fiscal sustainability is going to be uh, on the drive uh, of this thing. So if, you know, if I was to say what two things need to change um, the, in, in terms of how to think about the fiscal rules, that would be exp explicit fiscal coordination when it comes to dealing with shocks. Uh, and secondly, and I think here there is broad agreement uh, uh, across uh, the board, allow for green investments um, to be done uh, at a pace that is commensurate uh, with our ambitions. We have possibly the most ambitious greening program uh, possibly in the world, in Europe. We are not going to meet these ambitions unless uh, we allow for green investments to be uh, done differently than when any rules would impose. And here we have two problems. Uh, I think when it comes to the green investments, and that's going to bring me my third point. Um, first of all, what do we mean green investments? It's not a trivial point, and we see it already in the taxonomy uh, uh, categorization that the European Commission came out with. There are issues there of what constitutes green and what does not constitute green. So that is not a trivial problem that we, in my view, need to address head on. Um, uh, and the second one is that we don't start with a clean slate. It's not that we have fiscal space to deal with these issues, and it's certainly not at an equal degree for different countries. So how do you deal with these problems? How do you uh, um, allow for green investments, appropriately defined green investments, and how do you deal with the fact that not everybody is in the position to make similar investments? And that comes to my third point, and my third point is going to feed into the discussion that will come in the next, in the next session of risk, of risk sharing, uh, and there is a lot of things to be uh, discussed in the context of risk sharing, but the one that I think is important here to deal with the two problems I've just identified is the RRF. Um, as, as was pointed out by previous speakers, the RRF is a temporary uh, tool, but in my view, and of course it remains to be judged whether it would be an effective tool, but at least on paper and on design, it is a very effective way of dealing with these two problems. The, how do you define green investments and allowing countries uh, that are not uh, do not have quite the same fiscal space to advance with the green investments at the similar of the similar space. Uh, the RRF is uh, uh, has, in my view, uh, passed what I would call the political economy problem, uh, which is that it is an instrument that has been agreed by all. Um, it's not uh, a, a toxic federalist tool. At least it doesn't fall in the category of federalism, even though it is a tool for more effective risk sharing. It doesn't have the problems of discussions of federalism. Um, and that is, and that of course means that it is an easier thing to implement. And quite frankly, it has been agreed upon. So we have a template uh, to operate with. Uh, the other thing that in my view, the RRF uh, provides is, is the fact that because it is centrally um, uh, monitored and you know things need to be approved centrally before they can be implemented, money transfer and implemented, it will be a lot easier uh, to identify and agree on what constitutes green investments. And I think that is something that we really must use in order to make sure 
uh, that we don't uh, cut any corners when it comes to green investments. I would really encourage us uh, to use the RRF template to try and identify, or the governance of the RRF, uh, to try and identify what constitutes uh, uh, green investments. So my third point in this in, in this respect, and I'll, I'll finish here, perhaps come back in the discussion, is that we must think about the template or RRF as a tool for greater uh, uh, efforts to identify and to, to uh, rather to fulfill uh, what I call the European public goods, certainly the, the, the greening of the economy is a European public good. Now, I do not want to uh, use uh, the RRF or to, the opportunity to think about the RRF as a stabilization tool, but I must admit, uh, and that is something that we heard in, by previous speakers, but effectively that by releasing funds national funds to to uh, for future investments through the RRF, you provide a little bit of stabilization tool for national policy to uh, deal with shocks. So there is an element of stabilization also in the RRF, even though the character of the RRF is very much about the structural reforms for the digital and the green transition. Perhaps I'll stop here and I'll come back uh, in the discussion uh, on other issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for your contribution. You started off saying that the previous speakers have covered all, but in reality, you add a lot of elements. So you talk about policy coordination, the importance of fiscal rules, and then the green investment and the possibility of thinking about public good within the future of RFF discussion. So I think you add a lot of elements and we can discuss uh, later on. So I will now give the floor to Marian, Marian Salinas from the ESM. I think the ESM is uh, by nature a Euro area institution and as uh, Reiner mentioned previously, this crisis has been uh, dealt with with EU instruments. So maybe uh, Marion can uh, discuss a little bit this uh, dimension of uh, Euro area versus EU and also how the ESM fit in this debate and how could fit in the future. Please, uh, Marion, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, so I have the even more difficult task than Maria to come last. A lot, uh, a lot has been said already, a lot of uh, very interesting points. So I will actually focus my remarks more on the institutional dimension of EU governance and I will uh, pick up on one of the proposals that, that Klaus has mentioned and which I think fits nicely with, uh, with all what has been uh, said so far, so namely the, the integration of the ESM into the EU legal framework. Um, so this institutional dimension of EMU I think has been less discussed over the past few years when, when we, uh, so we had a lot of debates on EMU deepening but it was um, focusing on other things, less so on the institutional side of uh, of, uh, of EMU, and I think it is uh, quite important to also bring it into the picture. Uh, having a, a good governance framework can allow to pull together a coherent set of instruments. It can make sure that the cooperation among institutions works well. And last but not least, I mean, today is uh, the conference on the future of Europe addressed to citizens. So it can also play an important role in ensuring that the landscape, the institutional landscape is, is clear and, and transparent to citizens, which, uh, which is not an easy task in Europe, uh, as we know. Um, so in EMU, by definition, economic and financial affairs are non-exclusive competence of the EU, which means that governance is on two levels. So the national and the European level, on the national level, uh, member states and indeed their uh, reaction during the COVID crisis has been uh, instrumental, but also on the European level with European actors who guide, like the Commission, who guide the coordinated European action. And I think the interplay between these two levels is very important. Um, as, as Klaus recalled in his, uh, in his keynote speech, due to the urgency to act at the beginning of the sovereign debt crisis, the ESM was created on the European level, but outside the EU legal order. And um, your area government made the choice, the political choice, to um, endorse the ESM with a mandate to become active in markets, to support your area uh, governments as they were implementing the economic adjustment programs, and thereby to uh, preserve financial stability in the euro area. So the focus was, um, to, to come back to what uh, Reinhardt said, the focus was very much 
indeed on the euro area um, and so still being part obviously of, of like the joint European effort for mainly practical reasons it was done outside the EU legal framework. Um, when you look at the European history, this intergovernmental start is actually not uncommon. Um, it can be seen in, in several policy areas and typically uh, policy areas which are closely tied to national sovereignty, which are um, politically sensitive. I would like to pick a few examples. So one in the 80s was a Schengen Agreement in the area of security and justice. I think it's a case in point. It shows that um, governments first decided to act outside the EU framework, uh, precisely because of, of the close links with national sovereignty. And then some years later, it was integrated into the EU framework when the treaties were the EU treaties were amended. Another more recent example and more related to, to what we are discussing today was the fiscal compact uh, in 2012, which there again, um, for many political reasons, was signed was an international treaty signed outside the EU framework and which is expected to, to be integrated into the EU legal framework uh, at some point in the future. So keeping these historical uh, precedents in mind, I'd like to discuss uh, a little bit here and then maybe also in the, in the discussion how EU governance could evolve and in particular focusing on the ESM. And to do that, I think it's uh, it, a lot of uh, good lessons can indeed be drawn from the response to the COVID-19 crisis. And there I would uh, fully agree with what, uh, with what Reinhardt said. I think uh, one of the success factors of the response to the COVID-19 crisis was this uh, strong and well-coordinated response, the good cooperation among institutions, irrespective of their governance uh, models, so all institutions in their respective um, areas and, and according to their respective competences deployed complementary instruments. And I think this is what allowed the euro area to, to weather this, uh, this storm, if I may say. And I would even go as far as saying that, you know, the, the good um, figures from the Eurobarometer that uh, Klaus quoted, almost 80% of, uh, of citizens uh, supporting the euro uh, may well be explained by this, um, this strong and, and well-coordinated response. So I think this is an important point to, uh, to, to mention and emphasize in the discussion. The second point is that the blueprints which were created during the last crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, have proven very useful when uh, responding to this crisis. Uh, so indeed, there is, uh, as was mentioned already, there is an element of learning. And there, in this respect, I would like to, to mention the, the, experience, the case with the experience of the ESM. So the experience was made uh, back in 2012 uh, that it was possible to go on the market to issue large amounts of bonds uh, on attractive terms in a relatively short period of time. And this is possible, this was made possible by leveraging on the credit worthiness of a few highly rated uh, countries. And I think this successful precedent um, proved then useful when setting up at short notice in, uh, in a short period of time, both NGU and SHORE. Um, and so this also shows that uh, irrespective of, of, the, of the differences in the institutional setup, the current arrangement has, has worked well in practice. Still, uh, and I think this is the very purpose of, of this conference, as we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, as we draw lessons for it, it's good to think about uh, what could be potential institutional improvements of the EMU architecture. Um, and, uh, and there, I, I would like to refer to, to what Klaus said, so namely the, the possible integration of the ESM into the EU legal framework. So this is not a new proposal. It has been uh, mentioned in the Five Presidents report in 2015. Already, uh, the European Commission put forward a proposal also in 2017. Uh, we think it's a good uh, time to, to revisit the issue uh, and to think about how to implement it in a legally robust way, meaning when, uh, if and when the EU treaties would be reopened. Um, Integrating the ESM into the EU legal framework would enhance the consistency and the visibility of the of the EMU architecture for citizens. So that's 
what I was referring to at the beginning, this visibility and readability um, element would be quite important. All European institutions would be under the same roof, would cooperate under the same legal framework, and uh, the role of the European Parliament could be formalized, um, which would provide citizens with an additional and complementary level of, um, of accountability, so accountability at the uh, also European level. And this would, of course, come on top of the continued oversight by national parliaments, since ESM capital comes from a national budget, so this um, national level would still remain indispensable. The, the question is then, um, you know, how, how to implement it, which model to, to look at, and, uh, and there we think that the model of the European Investment Bank is, a, is quite a useful blueprint. It's a similar institution, also active in the market, um, raising debt, has a, a governance model with a strong involvement by member states, and it is in the EU legal order, so um, it's a useful uh, blueprint to, to look at. So we, we believe that um, doing it uh, this way through, through EU primary law change would ensure the highest legal certainty. Uh, it would also allow to take into account the specific needs of the ESM as regards uh, its governance, its decision making, its, uh, its functioning, uh, in particular the strong involvement of member states, as I was uh, referring to. At the same time, it would also allow to uh, imagine some adaptations in the overall setup, depending, of course, on political preferences and the evolving needs of, of the euro area, which we have discussed. To, to, to sum up, such a step is not urgent. Uh, anyway, it will not be implemented overnight. Uh, it would require treaty change. Uh, but still, this conference is a good opportunity to, to think a bit longer term and, uh, and discuss possible long, longer term institutional improvements in the, in the EMU architecture. I will stop here. And I think now we have a lot of uh, food for, for, the, for the discussion with the four interventions. Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Marion. We have a little less than uh, 30 minutes for discussion. We, we received a lot of questions uh, from, from the audience, also very elaborated. Uh, I would proceed as follow. I will give the floor in the same order that you presented your remarks. Uh, I will uh, sum up some of the questions that were addressed uh, either directly to one of you or more generally to all. And you can take the opportunity of taking the floor also to react maybe to what you've heard from uh, uh, the other panelists. Uh, so we, we, we manage time more efficiently. So starting from uh, Jean-Pierre, I think we had a question uh, on the capital market union, and I think you have quite a very good point of observation from the council. And the question was mainly related to the fact that everybody uh, is uh, in favor of capital market unions, but the fact that we haven't made, we, we haven't made too much progress, uh, especially on insolvency laws uh, and what pertains maybe not very much the, the, the financial filiere, but maybe the justice filiere. So if you can uh, have a comment on, on the progress uh, on the capital market unions and the importance and what would be um, needed to, to move, move it forward. Um, and the second one, maybe you can also answer uh, from your point of view, is that in all this debate about deepening EMU, sometimes there's uh, uh, not sufficient focus on the social dimension, inequalities. Uh, so just maybe you can share with, with, with the audience uh, how the social dimension of all this debate is perceived, uh, especially by our heads of state and government. And again, any other uh, uh, remarks that you want to share with us? Please, Jean-Pierre. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you, Nicola, and thank you, thank you for the question. I, I would like, in fact, first, um, and in fact, in a sense, it's also uh, it also relates um, to to the question from uh, from the audience. The first one is um, uh, Maria highlighted uh, the notion of uh, policy coordination, the value of policy coordination, and. Uh, Reinhardt uses uh, this uh, expression when he describes the driver of the policy response, like all sitting on the same boat and, you know, kind of this uh, feeling of uh, being together and having to, 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 to find a policy response together. It's all true. 
and uh, indeed. But what I would like to stress here is the role, in fact, of politics. There were two elements. One element was really that all institutions, I think, were fully aligned in their um, you know, willingness to contribute to, to finding a solution to this crisis. It was across the board. I mean, ESM, Commission, ECB, EIB, and others, the, super, the bank supervisors. I mean, so everyone was really kind of making all possible effort to propose and to come up with concrete solution to this challenge. And at the same time, at the political level, there was also a lot going on. So things happened, but it's not only the external driver, it was also the internal driver. And that requested a political process that was quite intense. And so I should remember, I should highlight actually here, that for example, when the crisis hit on the, in the early March 2000, um, 2020, up to the point when, in fact, we declared victory with the agreement of uh, July on next generation EU, it was a short period of time, but there were many, many meetings convened by the president of the European Council, where the all leaders met, met and actually uh, exchanged views on the situation and what should be done. And initially, we should also remember that the position were not kind of political, I mean, on the political side, fully aligned. I mean, people had different understanding of the crisis on the type of response that would be needed. And this political process was actually quite important to in the building of a, of a very convincing political response, and in particular, uh, next, next generation EU. So this brings me to the capital market union and banking union more broadly. I think to take things forward, I mean, what you need is you need, of course, a strong political will there. But you need it also that it's kind of a political will as at all level of governments. And it's true that some elements of capital market union, and you mentioned in solvency proceeding, I mean, there is kind of, I would say, among, you know, the in the financial track, this will not be something that is too controversial. So, in fact, at European level, there is a good understanding of what's, you know, what's, what has to be done. What is extremely important is that there is awareness among, in fact, all concert formation. I mean, all ministers about the importance of certain elements that are kind of strategic for the future of the Union and for the prosperity of all member states. And for example, sometimes, as you mentioned, this was mentioned in the question, justice minister, there there task is not really to take care of the financial landscape if you say if you if you if you if you want but they have somewhat to work on that as well because there are those that have to make the legal proposals the legal changes that allow for further progress so there there is a, a deeper political discussion to be had and i think it's going on and in fact i mean gradually i mean progress are being made and these awareness for example of the importance of um, of legal aspect there, you know, I mean, is something that uh, I mean has become increasingly prominent, in fact, in the discussion. So that's on that we are going on the right side. On the social dimension inequality, it's something that is completely mainstream. So in fact, it's not that you know you would. It's something that is in all policy areas. I mean, this social dimension is extremely important. I think all all are aware that in fact to make progress in Europe, and it goes back in fact even to the early start of, uh, of, uh, of the European Union or the European community. In fact, all was done with the support of member states, I mean, and to have an inclusive process really that benefits all citizens. So it's still there and uh, there are still intense discussion. And if you look at uh, the, um, the um, the discussion, uh, you know, or the, the declaration or statement of the European Council, for example, you will find very, very often this social dimension. It's also true that the reason why, at the end of the day, you make, you know, you want to make all this progress to have an economy that is more competitive, to have a capital market union that is well functioning, to have a banking union, is to, in fact, respond to the needs of our citizens and it's also to respond to the need of our businesses and the whole objective of it is to have a more vibrant economy that should benefit all 
you know, and within this context, I mean, be well aware of the social dimension and, for example, also of the quality of the jobs that we are going to create with all, with all these instruments and policies that we have. And I think, I mean, Reinhardt will certainly comment on that as well, that this is something that is also at the top of the Commission agenda when they come up with proposals and so on, where it's been, it has been completely mainstream in our policies in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, and, and of course, Reinhard can, can address also this point uh, uh, from his point of view. Uh, uh, on uh, specific questions uh, to Reinhard, there was uh, one about comparing uh, the two crises, the Eurodebt crisis and the, and the COVID crisis and the policy response. So the question was how much the different policy response was due to changed uh, institutional landscape or change the political attitude and how much was the difference uh, uh, related to the nature of the crisis so while the first one was mainly asymmetric and the second one more symmetric so you, if you can elaborate a bit on that and there was also a question which is a little bit of monetary policy i don't know how much you want to address it is how much the credit channels is working versus uh, uh, expectation channel so I think that the, the, the participant alluded to the fact that during this crisis, the, the credit channels didn't work at all while everything was managed through expectation. So the floor is yours. Um, thank, thanks a lot. Um, and, and thanks a lot to, to all the, uh, the participants who are, who are putting very interesting questions and, uh, and, and comments in the chat. Um, on, this, on the difference of crisis, I mean, this was one of the points that I really wanted to drive home. The difference of the crisis, uh, and, uh, and I understand this was also, um, you know, the point by uh, by, by Jean Pierre and um, and um, um, <clears throat> and Maria, that the difference of the crisis really made a, a big difference on the on the ability to um, to respond. It changed the narrative. Um, the political context was different, um, and there everybody was really aligned to 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 find a cooperative solution to that. In the financial crisis, this was much more a narrative about policy failure at member state level um, for the right or the wrong. Um, it was more loaded also with with judgments um, about who did what wrong. And, uh, and and that that made it much more difficult. And, and honestly, I think there there are still there are still differences of views about the diagnosis of this financial crisis and, uh, and the sovereign debt crisis. Um, so that that was much different. And here I may be also putting pouring a little bit of water in my in my uh, almost natural optimism. I think it was easier to get a consensus on the policy mix in this acute crisis situation faced with a pandemic. It is much. It will be much more challenging, you know, looking ahead at a new steady state um, of uh, of policy um, orientations, um, and, and that uh, that is also what what the challenge will be on the on the governance review and the discussion that we are having. Um, we are approaching this discussion um, on the at the Commission side by actually trying to first focus the minds on the diagnosis. Where are we in terms of uh, economic situation and fiscal situation? Um, what are the prospects and where do we want to travel? And here I would also like to come in on something that, uh, that, that Maria said and make a link with a question about the social policy dimension and, and equality. Because the, the, the point that we need substantial investment, including public investment, in order to make progress on the ambitious climate change objectives that we have collectively adopted um, is, uh, is, a, is a paramount um, um, element in the discussion that we're having. And there are, there are different ways of looking at that. And one dimension that I think one must not undervalue in the discussion is that you need social compensation. I mean, you, you need to make sure that uh, that you don't leave um, people out in uh, in the climate transition. I and mean, we as we as economists are, are very fast by saying, well, relative prices need to be changed. But such kind of changes of relative prices have repercussions on uh, on, on on certain uh, certain households and and and, uh, and more and more negative repercussions on some than for others. So we have to be very conscious of this, and this adds another complication to the question: What actually are green investment? 
is the social redistribution that may be necessary in order to get the political agreement to necessary steps and reform steps? Is this part of this kind of green investment? Um, I don't know. I mean, we're where 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 one quickly also risks moving and into a slippery a slippery slope in this direction. And I would like to, if I if I may, also pose a question to Maria because you said you would like that within the context or the framework of the RRF, one could further define what green investments are. I, I would be interested to to hear what you have what you have in mind. Um, I I could have uh, some 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 things in mind. But the other um, elements, I mean, just uh, in a stenographic manner, I mean, my my mention of credit channels remain open is merely a, a, an empirical uh, fact that, uh, you know, the extension of credit to the private sector during this crisis um, basically was maintained. Um, and uh, and I think this is this is uh, basically the result of a, of a combination of things, the, the ECB policies combined with the guarantees provided by national um, authorities um and uh, and of course expectations have been extremely important to stabilize the overall economy um and uh, and of course you need you need stable and uh, and, and positive forward looking expectations also for for uh, the corporate sector to invest so i think it's a uh, may, maybe a combination of of those things on uh, um on th there was there was i think christian um, Brown or Bowen, who, who was saying, well, economic integration, but what about labor mobility? I think, I mean, just a, a quick remark on that. Um, of course, with COVID, labor mobility has again uh, gotten a, a, a hit. Um, we have seen over the past 20 years of, uh, of Euro area some increase in terms of cross border mobility. But let's not, you know, let's, let's, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, labor, labor mobility will not provide the stabilizing. Um, role that that uh, that it um, may play in the United States. So this is exactly why we have why we are having this discussion about the, about risk sharing um, mechanisms in the in the euro area, RRF um, and stabilization and time lags. Uh, fully agree. This is uh, this is one of the reasons why I think in economic terms it was very very wise to to basically load the RRF. With a num, I mean, with heavily with supply side aspects and and more longer term aspects. I mean, it just takes a lot of time to put this kind of instruments um, in motion, and the the fast stabilization reaction really came through the through the measures taken at the at the national member states. Um, inflation disaster. Not much to say here from 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 our side. Um, maybe just I mean we're now in full swing and preparing our winter interim forecast. Um, the energy price developments with has has a, a strong cyclical dimension. I mean, cyclical in terms of temporary um, um, impact is driving a lot our profile for inflation. And I think here we are pretty much in line with the uh, with the ECB. Um, now it's difficult to completely forecast. You know what kind of uh, of second round effects uh, will will happen from that from from that. But uh, when looking at the evolution of futures uh, for, for energy prices, we see that there is a, a peak, um, at least currently in the charts um, for some time mid this year. So yes, we believe, I mean, there is no inflation um, disaster. Um, and after almost 10 years of inflation around zero, um, we, we should probably also rejoice to some extent and if inflation comes closer over the medium term to the, to the overall um, target. And I would, and the last remark, sorry, ESM integration, I, um, the commission proposal, of course, remains on the table. We have not withdrawn it. Um, I think it would um, help the, it would be good for the ESM and the EU as a whole if the ESM were integrated into the EU uh, legislative framework. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Reinhard. Uh, I think, Maria, you already have a question from, from, from Reinhard. I think can be complemented to another question in the chat. If you can elaborate a bit on uh, how, what would be the the, 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 the the linkages between a possible permanent RRF and a macroeconomic uh, stabilization tool? I would add uh, uh, also a couple of other questions. Uh, um, somebody raised the issue of fiscal sustainability that uh, I think is not the focus of, of this panel, but uh, I think the questions were, were was about how much the fiscal sustainability issue would influence the debate on fiscal capacity on the cooperation. So how much is the elephant in the room in the policy discussion? 
And my final question, you underscore the political dimension of all this debate. Maybe you can share with us what is your view uh, on the current uh, uh, political landscape in Europe uh, uh, with the uh, uh, new German government, uh, uh, French election, uh, presidential election in Italy, also Portugal is going to election. So how much this political development will shape in one way or the other the debate on deepening EMU? Thanks, Maria. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, so there is questions that are sh shot in many different directions. Uh, and, and of course, that, that makes it interesting. <laughs> um, so th there is a lot of things that I'd like to comment on, perhaps, in, in, and put a few things. They're all interlinked. The political, uh, the political will, um, let me just say up front that I think circumstances now in terms of the context, what I was trying to say in my comments, that the context identifies the political will. I think the context right now is very conducive to political climate making sort of positive progress when it comes to sort of how do we deal with the robustness of EMU. Uh, this is a very long way to say that I think this is good news. I think there is a, a lot more understanding and through circumstances and measures taken and learning uh, uh, to to promote uh, uh, to promote the project as much as we can, so more than ever. Um, but let me let me link that back to the discussion of diagnosis of previous crisis, how we reacted in in, in all these crises. I think, um, and Reinhardt made a very nice description of the whole thing. Um, the back then it was a blaming game. The financial crisis and the sovereign crisis was very much about a blaming game that really stopped us on our heels from making progress. And I certainly agree that everybody who comes into the room in Brussels all want to find a solution to the problem, but not everybody agrees what the problem is. Uh, and everybody comes in with their own perspective about the the problem and who bears the costs of solving it. And this is where the lack of progress emerges. So I my point that I, I think is important to remember is that participation in the single currency requires means interdependence. A problem that happens at one edge of Europe affects everybody else. This is everybody's problem. And that implies that, you know, everybody has a responsibility to try and, 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 and preserve the edifice. But I think here comes a very interesting uh, dynamic uh, in motion of trading individual responsibility for collective support. In the next session, you're going to call this what I just described. You're going to call it risk sharing versus uh, risk reduction. But effectively, that's what it is. You need to have both an individual responsibility in putting your house in order, but you also need to have collective support because of the interdependence. So I think a dichotomy between the two has been uh, um, actually the very wrong way of perceiving the thing. We need both risk sharing and risk reduction if you want to think about insurance on the project. That's the political will, in my view, needs to be guided by the fact that insurance requires both. Um, uh, to the question that uh, Ranhar uh, talked about the RRF and the greening, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, the governance of the RRF provides us a template that is better. And what do I mean by that? Instead of allowing countries to decide what constitutes a green project, it would be more efficient in my way, in my, in my view, if we brought this at the centralized level, agree what project is green, and then finance it through common means, through the RRF. That is the point that I was trying uh, uh, to make, because the incentive for countries to pass many projects as green are very big. Uh, and that, of course, is going to hit problems with the use of common resources to finance projects that are doubtful green. One way of solving that is centralize the decision of what project per project, what constitutes RRF, and leave it at that. Linking the RRF to debt, the point I was trying to make is that not everybody starts with the same level of, uh, uh, of indebtedness. Many countries, by the end of this crisis, if we can see the end of this crisis, will have debt levels that are huge. Therefore, their capacity to make the green investments that are required uh, for Europe to achieve its uh, green ambitions will not be there. The RRF, by centralizing resources, is going to make sure, and that will be a part of my wish list, should make sure that everybody advances on the greening of these economies at the minimum space that is acceptable. Otherwise, we will not be able to meet our, uh, our green ambitions. Um, if I may, two more points on, on the questions that are coming that are extremely interesting, actually. But, um, 
on the CMU, um, the, uh, it, there is now evidence that countries that have got more developed capital markets do better in picking up the risks that are associated with green the economies. Yet one more reason to advance with CMU. Um, but uh, one of also of the, of the comments in the chat say that we are not making any progress with CMU. So with that, I would say perhaps we should make more progress with CM rather than with, with you. Uh, I know that this is perhaps not the right way around because we want the scale, but even for banking union, we haven't made huge advances in really creating a, a market for a common market for banks. Let's at least create a, a market for capital before we make it a common market for capital. And then the last thing, inflation. Um, I don't know, maybe we can have it in the next round, but inflation is a, is a very complicated uh, discussion. And in my view, it's going to put the position, it's going to make uh, the position at some point of the central bank rather difficult and unattainable. I'll stop here unless you want me to elaborate on that, but I think there is, uh, this is enough. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, so I will give the floor now to, to Marion to complete the, 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 the round. I think you can pick it up a bit in what uh, uh, Reiner alluded uh, on, on the proposal by the Commission to integrate uh, the ESM into the EU level framework uh, and uh, how you see it compared to what you have uh, elaborated in your initial remarks. And the second one uh, coming from the chat, uh, maybe a brief discussion on the pandemic crisis support. Uh, uh, the fact that, uh, as Reiner mentioned, was instrumental to calm the markets, but eventually was not utilized, and how much a different uh, institutional setting of the ESM could uh, help taking up uh, facilities of the ESM. Please, Marion. Yeah. Thank you, Nicola. Um, so, indeed, uh, as I also mentioned in my remarks, uh, there was this uh, legislative proposal by the European Commission in, in 2017 which uh, at the time was not, uh, was not discussed in length uh, by, by member states. Um, our uh, stake, uh, like our stance on this is that, you know, when, when you have um, so many uh, bonds outstanding uh, in the market, so like uh, million, billions of, of bonds that investors have bought, we need to ensure the highest level of legal certainty. Uh, that's very important for uh, well investors, for the for the public in general, and for the robustness of the of the reform. And uh, we believe that the the solution that offers this uh, highest level of legal certainty would be to uh, change the EU treaties. Even though we acknowledge that this is obviously a more uh, cumbersome procedure, and that's why uh, it's also not for tomorrow. This is more of a longer term uh, step. But this would um, bring the the highest guarantees in terms of legal certainty. Also, in terms of institutional autonomy for the ESM, uh, because in that case, you would not be bound uh, by the constraints of EU uh, primary law. I don't want to enter here into legal details, but you would not be constrained by this, uh, by the Maroni doctrine, for example. So you would have also certain advantages in terms of, um, of uh, institutional autonomy, uh, legal certainty, and, and in general, more, more flexibility. So, even though it is uh, more, um, I mean, it would take more time, obviously, uh, we believe it would be preferable also because, it, as I said, it is not urgent, so it doesn't need to be implemented in the next uh, one or two years, and it could be part of a broader uh, package of, uh, of, of reforms, I mean, some of the things we have discussed here and, and maybe some others. Uh, so this is about uh, the proposal on the pandemic uh, crisis support. So it is true indeed that it has not been uh, requested so far, but I think it's important to uh, recall what was what was the design and uh, what it builds on. So it is mainly uh, a precautionary tool. It works as an insurance, uh, which means that it is valuable even if it hasn't been used. And actually it had a like confidence enhancing effect back in spring 2020. Uh, alongside with the other um, responses of the of the other institutions, which which we mentioned, and uh, yeah, so so this market uh, confidence confidence enhancing effect is very important, and the fact that countries have not requested it shows that uh, they have still had access to markets at uh, at on reasonable terms, which is uh, which is a positive sign about the strength of of the euro area. Um, I, I wanted to pick up if time, uh, one, one or two minutes to pick up on, on some other points. Um, so there were two questions, one on what could be the future work of the ESM, and then 
uh, indeed the link between the fiscal capacity and the high debt levels. Um, so without preempting too much on the second panel, which will, uh, which will come uh, in a minute, what we are thinking about is indeed how fiscal stabilization uh, capacity could help. But we see it very much um, as, again, as part of a broader package. And in this context, I would like to, uh, to draw your attention to a proposal which was made uh, by uh, ESM colleagues about how to reform the fiscal rules. Uh, I, I'm sure you are aware um, to raise um, the debt level to 100% uh, percent of GDP have uh, different rules depending on where the country stands. And this, we think, uh, is, is a, good, a good way to, let's say, uh, kill two, two birds with one stone. So uh, bring political consensus, both on the reform of fiscal rules and on, on a fiscal stabilization capacity, because we're aware indeed that uh, uh, debt levels are very high, so we need to also find a, 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 like a new uh, software, so to say, uh, which is uh, politically uh, consensual and which would allow to um, uh, to, to make uh, the euro more euro area more sustainable. Um, and and then a final point, if if you allow me, Nicola, on this EU versus euro area dimension, because this was mentioned several times during this panel, uh, in particular by uh, Reinhard, who, who rightly pointed out that the COVID response was mainly EU wide uh, with the RRF, and that's fully true. Also, there have been political developments like Brexit, uh, meaning that politically, maybe the, this EU dimension has become stronger, but I think we should not forget, as you said yourself, the next crisis will be different. And economically, the needs of the euro area uh, countries remain there. Uh, they have not disappeared. Maybe they were less uh, pressing as such during the COVID crisis, but we should not uh, lose sight of the fact that, um, you know, they have only one single monetary policy with the higher uh, debt levels, fiscal policy will be constrained in the future. So I think this economic narrative is still uh, very important. Uh, having said that, I think the two are not mutually exclusive and the euro area could go further in some areas. Uh, the EU could uh, go further in other areas. I mean, we mentioned climate, uh, digital transition, etc. And they could, they could be combined also in explaining it to citizens that uh, the, the functional needs are different depending on the policy areas. So that was my, my final point on EU versus your area. Uh, thank you very much, Marion. Uh, I think we had so many uh, topics discussed and would deserve uh, another round, but unfortunately we don't have time because the next panel will start at 2.45 after uh, a short uh, virtual coffee break. I think some of the issues that we discussed and also some of the questions that were in the chat will be answered by the next uh, panel which would focus on uh, risk sharing in the euro area. I want to thank uh, uh, the panelists, uh, Maria Reinhardt, uh, Jean-Pierre and Marion uh, for your participation, your insight. I think it was a very lively discussion. Also, I want to task the man, uh, thank the many uh, uh, participants in the audience for the very relevant questions. I invite you to stay in this event, uh, as I say, at 2.45, we'll have the, the, the second panel on risk sharing. Thanks a lot and see you in uh, six minutes. Bye-bye. you hear me so far i just need quick technical support you did not then let me welcome you again good afternoon everyone uh, to the second session of our conference on how to deepen europe's economic and monetary union further 
In the second session, we will deal more deeply with risk sharing in the euro area. And let me just briefly recall how Klaus Regling, when he opened up the conference, defined risk sharing. It is the sum of mechanisms through which a shock, positive or negative, to a country's economy is transmitted to other member states. Or to put it reversely, it is the resource flows that go through member states from one member state to the other that help to buffer possibly shocks hitting a country in monetary union. We will talk more deeply on how that works. We will talk more deeply what it actually means because it's a pretty abstract concept uh, that was expressed so far. We will talk about the different channels that this can take and we will do so with a great panel of experts that we have here. So there is Nicola Carnot, Lucrecia Reichlin, Isabel van Steenkiste, and Matthias Susek from the academia, from different institutions that have written on the topic that are deeply involved in the discussion. And that will help us in understanding those different elements. We, I, let me open up the panel then with Nicolas Carnot. He will give his presentation, the rules quote unquote of the game are the same as in the last panel. There will be introductory statements. During those statements, please feel free to enter your questions, comments in the chat, and then we will uh, take them up afterwards. I will open with Nicola. Nicola is Director of Economic Studies and Synthesis of the French Statistical Office. Just allow me to appreciate the fact that they wrote into your title what I think you always did in providing um, a consistent and concise policy advice in terms of synthesis. You held previously positions in the French Economic Administration as well as in international organizations. Among others, you, you served as a chief auditor of the Cour de Compte um, and as fiscal policy advisor, advisor in DG ECFIN and deputy director and head of economic forecasts in the French Treasury. Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you for participating. Thank you very much, uh, Rolf. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm honored and pleased uh, as well to uh, share some ideas and mostly to listen from, uh, from others and participants. Uh, of course, I speak only in very personal capacity today, uh, not on behalf of my current or former institution, uh, certainly not on behalf of the French presidency, this goes without saying. Um, uh, I would start uh, by uh, stating that the state of play, in my view, in terms of risk sharing and stabilization capacities uh, in EMU remain fragile. Um, already in the previous panel, we uh, heard that this is not a new issue. The instability risks from that became conspicuous during the uh, financial crisis a decade ago. There was a response, uh, some innovations. The URA uh, equipped itself with uh, liquidity providing instruments, uh, well, starting with the ESM actually, and took a number of steps uh, in terms of private risk, private risk sharing, the banking union, the, the CMU. Uh, on the other hand, there was uh, no progress essentially in uh, over the 2010s over enhancing fiscal stabilization mechanisms. Many proposals were made. The Commission even tabled a legislative proposal for a stabilization function, a modest one, in spring uh, 2018, but this gained uh, zero traction and actually a certain deadlock over these issues uh, characterized the discussion pre-COVID. Now, you may ask, and this was already touched upon before, uh, to what extent did the uh, policy, the development and policy response to COVID transform uh, the state of play? Well, it's true that the recent experience stands in strong contrast to the financial crisis. There was massive macro support, uh, which smoothed household incomes, provided ample liquidity to firms, significantly also cross-border private flow uh, proved resilient this time, in my view, illustrating the complementarity between the public uh, response and the private channels for uh, risk sharing. So. An optimist might claim, given this experience, well, 
you know, the EU has shown capacity to act and can do it again whenever needed. Uh, this is uh, too optimistic, uh, probably. The risk-sharing problem actually is not solved. Uh, the initiatives that were taken are mostly one-off, not permanent programs. Uh, NGEU, the most uh, flagship prominent of, of which is a wildly different animal from the, let's say, the blueprint uh, fiscal capacity of economists. The sure mechanism maybe comes a bit closer to it in spirit, but is a, is a limited instrument. And moreover, uh, public balance sheets actually are even more stretched now that they were before the COVID crisis. So the room for maneuver in the sense is actually uh, declined in a way. So maybe IDs can again be improvised and put in place whenever the crisis, the next uh, problem comes. But in any event, it's very useful to have uh, further reflection and discussion uh, including with this event, so that the ideas uh, do not come from the sky, but they are ready uh, to draw upon when, when the time comes. Now, uh, when it comes to building this, uh, let's say, complementary fiscal capacity, what are the uh, guiding economic principles, uh, the guiding principles that one should draw on? Essentially, I would say there are two. It should be economically relevant and it should be politically acceptable. Economic relevance means, well, it should deliver effective stabilization. Political feasibility requires essentially credibly addressing the concern that any such system would turn into a permanent subsidization of certain member states. Uh, let me touch on the two. Start with effective stabilization properties. What are the needed operational characteristics? Again, mostly there are two in my view, the size and the timing. And the two work together in the sense that the objective here is to produce a substantial impact in a timely manner, not permanently, and not outside severe circumstances. There is a long discussion about the trigger. I will probably go fast on it. On it. Uh, I have come to think by now that a sort of semi-automatic system could be an adequate compromise. One could, for example, combine uh, monitoring a parsimonious dashboard, GDP growth, unemployment, maybe the effective lower bond, with some amount of discretionary judgment and decision. What is clear is that the focus should remain on large shocks, the idea being to complement national budget stabilizer in stretched events. And also what matters is that the level of support is related, if you wish, to the magnitude of the shocks. Now, noticeably, these stabilization characteristics mean that the underlying amount of resources does not need to be huge. Uh, to put it quickly and a bit schematically uh, for the sake of clarity, if you put aside 0.1% of GDP every year in normal times, one, you can draw down 1% of GDP in crisis year, which is maybe every 10 years. If you double the amount, you can of course double the support. Um, nonetheless, I think such a system should enjoy the possibility of a borrowing capacity, although again, not such a large one uh, and not one that can be sustained and one that can be sustained by relatively limited resources. Maybe it can also be a bit pre-finance as in the kind of rainy defund approach, but perhaps one should not bet too much on that. Now, together with economic relevance, the other requirement is political acceptability. In a sense, limited required resources facilitates it. But even then, the key constraint is to devise a system that addresses the concern about permanent transfers. Here, the focal point is to what extent what can, one can go beyond the provision of cheap loans. Maybe we can have more on that, like a revolving fund, as was alluded to by, not alluded to, as was mentioned by the managing director of the ISM in his speech. But the key question in my view is how you could, on top of that, go with temporary transfers. To be practical, uh, let me mention two options by increasing order of ambitions. A first option would be to introduce a fiscal capacity that focuses squarely and only on common shocks. Now, to be clear what I mean by that, it could be that the support is exactly the same for all member states as a percent of GDP. So the capacity will smooth euro-wide shocks intertemporally. 
That first option would obviate the risk of inter-country transfers by construction. It would respond to a need, a central budgetary tool to complement monetary policy, especially in certain circumstances. However, this option would not be sufficient to provide enough country-specific shock absorption. And this may remain difficult as long as a number of member states are constrained in their use of national fiscal policy, either by rules that are strictly applied or by sustainability adopts that may compromise their market access, particularly in difficult circumstances. The case is also stronger as long as private risk sharing is limited. For this reason, the second option is to have an instrument that provides support against both array wide and specific shocks. In this second option, how do you conciliate with the no permanent transfer requirement? This is a classic insurance problem with no ideal solution. To overcome it, and I finish with that, two things, two things strike me as important. First, there should be a complete veil of ignorance ex ante as to whom is likely to benefit in the future from the instrument. Second, however, it would be counterproductive economically to impose a strict budget neutral neutrality condition ex post. Or if that is the case, it needs to be a very, very long requirement at most. What is advisable, however, is that there is something like a form of experience rating or maybe some soft clawback mechanism. For example, one could differentiate insurance premia with previous use of the fund by member states. So strong users would see a, bit, a fee a bit higher, thereby preserving incentives and not jeopardizing their macroeconomic recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Really a great outline of, of the issues and also of the governance principles um, of such a mechanism. You mentioned economic relevance, political feasibility, semi-automaticity, uh, what shocks to address, and also in, in the end, the point of incentive compatibility. We will have a chance to go deeper into this. Let me now turn to Lucrezia Reichlin, uh, who has also published on the topic. Lucrezia Reichlin is full professor of economics at the London Business School and um, very well known active contributor to the Center of Economic Policy Research, where she is also now a trustee. She is also a fellow of the Econometric Society and the European Economic Association, in addition to private sector positions that you hold, and obviously also in addition to your position at the ECB, heading research there. Lucrecia, you have worked on this topic as well, next to your all your other work uh, on forecasting and business cycles and monetary policy. And in that context, how do you look at the question of risk sharing, also with a view to the monetary fiscal mix? Lucrecia, we cannot hear you. Okay, thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, you know, to, to be able to contribute to this discussion, especially because the ESM is such an important institution uh, uh, in this uh, complex governance. Now, in the questions you sent me, um, you asked me to talk about uh, a new uh, piece that uh, with colleagues, uh, both economists uh, and uh, an uh, expert uh, on uh, juridical on uh, legal issues, uh, we we have uh, we have um, we have written and, and contributed just for for the broader debate. And let me uh, just tell you, you know, the spirit of that paper, because I mean, this discussion on, on uh, resharing has been going on and on for years now, and I, there is a certain fatigue, although I can also see a certain sense of enthusiasm after the most successful response to the pandemic. So, I mean, the, the, the question where we started uh, uh, was really, you know, all what you, you know our governance our tools uh, are the um, are the product uh, of the treaties okay the Ma the maastricht treaty and then some adjustment that we have done uh you know as a consequence of the multiple crises that uh, we have uh, experienced 
And the question is, how stressed are we from, from the legal point of view? And uh, is it, uh, are, are the constraints of uh, what, ideally what should be done and what we, we can actually do um, legal or political? And uh, actually, uh, I think that uh, most of us would today um, agree that the Maastricht Treaty was written uh, in a very, very different uh, situation in the 90s, where um, you know the, the, the economy was different. And it's, it has a philosophy which is based on a very a clear separation between monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, nobody can deny that uh, monetary and fiscal policy both contribute to, to stabilization of output, but also of inflation, um, in a way to divide the government between central banks uh, and fiscal authorities um, is just an institutional decision, is a political decision, but you know, the, both uh, the central banks and the fiscal authorities are part of the general government. So we can say that uh, uh, Maastricht, uh, uh, you know, ch has chosen a certain uh, uh, institutional design to solve the problem of coordination, and uh, the way in which it solves it is uh, it gives uh, ECB independence, including financial independence, so that fiscal policy actually has to take monetary policy as given and react to it, but then also. Um, you know, has established fiscal rules uh, and a number of other provisions like no bailout, uh, the prohibition of monetary financing, uh, ECB financial independence, the principle of proportionality, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, with the multiple crisis uh, since 2008 uh, to the pandemic, uh, what we have learned is that uh, um, especially at the zero lower bound, but not only at the zero lower bound, uh, we need uh, a much more active uh, use of the fiscal of the fiscal tool. And uh, you know the fiscal rules are not necessarily delivering what has to be delivered. Have led to procyclicality in certain uh, you know um, contingencies and so on. And. Um, also, we have learned that fiscal, uh, even away from the zero lower bound, can be more effective tools that, than monetary. Um, um, for example, so when the shocks uh, are shocks uh, like the pandemic shocks that require sector interventions and so on, but there are lots of other uh, examples. Also, the ECB is not the ECB that it used to be because you know now it uses all kinds of different tools. Uh, which uh, have implications, uh, including uh, implications of credit risk and with so with uh, fiscal consequences. And, um, and you know, the ECB has given itself all kinds of safeguards uh, so that uh, it, it has enlarged his set of instruments, but also have put limitations in the way they can use it. And this has actually led to, to problems or so legal uncertainty of what they can do and what they cannot do. Um, and then also there is the issues uh, of, uh, you know, how to manage this risk uh, since, uh, and, and so they, they, and how, you know, this new risk uh, threaten the financial independence of the ECB and shouldn't we think, shouldn't we think about uh, central bank capital uh, in a different way. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what we have learned and, um, and then, uh, you know, most of us, and I think also at this conference, uh, uh, you know, have a number of solutions to these problems, okay? Now, what we have done with our colleagues, uh, inclu including the legal expert, is that actually for most of the things we want to do, the constraints is not the treaty, although the treaty can be, should be reinterpreted, uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, the, the, the hard constraints do not come from the treaty but they actually come from politics. I mean, I think that uh, the member countries uh, uh, have not bought the idea of a fiscal federation and what this entails in terms of resharing. So I think that this is uh, a way of rephrasing the debate, okay? So what does politics want, okay? Because at the end, you know, uh, we don't want to construct Europe uh, um, just as a bureaucratic exercise, right? Because, you know, we want to have the, our citizens with us. 
Um, so, okay, now having said that, uh, uh, so in terms of resharing, I think the issues, uh, um, you know, on content, let me say a few things on content. Uh, I think it's very important uh, uh, to think about, uh, you know, what kind of monitoring fiscal coordination do we want? Okay, so there is a range of solutions uh, on, in that area. So um, to have a central fiscal capacity is only one corner, okay? But there is a lot that uh, we can do. Um, for example, uh, uh, you know, I think that, uh, um, you know, there are no particular legal uh, constraints about thinking of soft coordination between the fiscal authorities and the central monetary authority. Even in another report in which we have commented uh, on the ECB strategy review, we are suggesting uh, uh, to have uh, a form of soft coordination that uh, on the uh, on the um, on the model of the macro prudential board uh, this is of course doesn't solve any problem but at least helps uh, uh, you know to build a common understanding a common analysis uh, on what needs to be done at the federal level we are also uh, um, suggest that uh, we should go for uh, you know callable capital in order to you know to to give the the, the ECB the possibility okay to expand the, the the balance sheet if needed but also to manage the risk by having some kind of uh, of framework uh, for which uh, you know to ask capital to the fiscal authorities and after all that's a very important uh, issue that is not in my view debated enough credibility of central bank actions at the end comes from you know the um, from the possibility of of getting capital which is essentially a fiscal issue and then we uh, we also discuss um, we also discuss you know the issue of fiscal capacity and you know pre pandemic uh, uh, there were basically two discussions one was we need fiscal capacity for stabilization another one was we need fiscal capacity for growth and providing uh, eu public goods now post pandemic uh, with the experience of the ngu and we know the ngu has cut you know on on both uh, issues uh, and um, uh, crucially, however, the NGO is not a budget, uh, but uh, is, you know, is, a, is an emergency instrument. This has been said also in the first panel. So in transitioning to, you know, to be what it is today and uh, uh, to be a budget with its own resources uh, um, would be actually that that passage would be legally more controversial. And, um, you know, so that will lead to, you know, to the beginning of a federal structure in the EU, which is really completely different, a different idea. However, uh, we are proposing uh, we, to build an NGO, to build some capacity and one possibility, which, you know, and there are different possibilities which are not mutually exclusive. One is, for example, rolling over NGO debt. The other is a creating a new mechanism for coordination between the EU and the national levels, um, so that uh, basically, which could be a mechanism that would uh, um, create a different way of operating, uh, actually, for the Commission. So when uh, you know interacting with countries uh, uh, to you know to on on the fiscal on fiscal rules. And the third one is creating a standing contingent facilities uh, for emergency, uh, for emergency, um, uh, for emergency, you know, projects, uh, you know, situations, you know, the next shocks and so on, which would have, of course, uh, some legal and some, uh, you know, some framework, uh, a trigger and some rules and so on. Now, um, let me say just one more thing, because I think I, I, I'm uh, over time. Uh, um, if this is all something that uh, has been discussed, each of us has his own best version of how can this be done. But, uh, you know, I think that it is really time to discuss about the general principles, okay, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of what can be done. Um, but if we look at the next decades, uh, uh, there I think there is quite, I, I think there is room for concerns. And I think the main room for concern for the next decades is the fact that uh, between the debt that we have inherited from the last crisis and the debt that we will have to create in order to cope with the climate transitions, and here the numbers are numbers that comes from 
the commission itself. Uh, some of that will have to be financed by public investment. The carbon tax is not going to do, you know, the old job, as we know. Um, so these are big numbers. Uh, and uh, our debt is not safe because, uh, you know, we, we have different fiscal authorities and one central bank. So the question, I think, is how can, it, can we possibly, you know, address the problems of the transition in the next decades, uh, which would require living with high debt? And, uh, you know, let's forget about this fantasy that we will consolidate, uh, you know, anytime soon. So how do we make it safe? How do we make sure that this debt will remain safe? And there, I mean, there is a huge literature about that, and I think we have to look really carefully about this literature. It's not just about RNG, but it is also, you know, about the conditions uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that make that safe. So partly is actually the ability to, prov to provide public goods and, and, and to which, uh, uh, you know, will generate growth uh, and cohesion because we have to compensate the losers. And, uh, but partly is also possibly some financial engineering in terms of uh, creating common debt uh, at some point uh, in one form or another. And then here the discussion on the debt agencies and so on are all relevant for, for this, for this uh, kind of more forward looking discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lucrezia, for putting this into the broader picture. So, I, I mean, from what you said, the world has changed in a sense that there is more policy, policy active policy response needed. Uh, that's clear after the pandemic. At the same time, fiscal policies is kind of twisted within the already outstanding more debt. And where is the stabilization capacity on the one hand and the needing to invest more and maybe even create more debt on the other hand? And um, you outlined the different mechanisms of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy uh, that can play a role here. Let me turn to the monetary policy side, if you wish, then in, in a certain sense, and welcome Isabel van Steenkiste. Um, and Isabel is Director General in the Directorate General European and International Relations at the European Central Bank. You have held different other senior management positions in the ECB before, also on monetary policy. So in the context of this panel, let me then turn to you and ask you also how you look at this monetary fiscal interaction, but also how you see the role of private risk sharing in generating a resilient European monetary union, Isabel. Thanks a lot, Rolf, and uh, great to be talking on this panel, and thanks for inviting. I mean, uh, looking very much forward also to the discussions, and uh, great to hear also the views of the other panelists. Just also to start by stressing that, of course, I'm talking here in my personal capacity and, and not on behalf of the ECB. I mean, as you mentioned in, 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 in your intro here, I mean, I'm going to focus a little bit maybe to complement what the other two speakers have already talked about on 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 the private risk sharing, but still bring in a little bit of public risk sharing, because I think, you know, um, one, one can to some extent uh, um, substitute for the other, but I mean, they're definitely also complementing each other and, and, and we need both in the most we need. And maybe in terms of the structure, I'll start by looking a little bit at where we stand currently in, in, in the monetary union in terms of the degree of risk sharing. And then move forward to say where, where can we go from there and also talk a little bit about the strategy review. I was partly involved in the in the work stream on, on monetary fiscal interactions there and and what were kind of the main findings that came out of there that that may have a bearing on, on what we have to say here. So maybe starting just where we stand in the pandemic. And I think like as Lucrezia mentioned, I mean, on the one hand, you know, there's a bit of fatigue on, on, on the risk sharing discussion. I mean, we've been going on for it for a long time. At the same time, there was a bit of new hope, let's say, in the pandemic, because we saw new instruments and, and, and Europe getting together in a way that was quite unprecedented. And when we try to measure through metrics of risk sharing what has happened, I mean, the traditional measures are not really maybe applicable because private consumption is normally the measure we look at consumption smoothing. Um, as a metric to see how much risk sharing there is across uh, borders. But of course, in the pandemic, uh, consumption was more or less um, quite, quote unquote, distorted, let's say, because households were prevented from uh, consuming their normal consumption basket. So we more look at, at income risk sharing. But 
when we look at these metrics and we just look historically over what's happened and then the pandemic hits, we kind of see that you know there was not much change. Yeah, and so uh, on the positive side, you can say risk sharing has remained resilient in the pandemic, which was a great achievement. And the way we have avoided that there was a collapse, let's say, in, in private risk sharing. And um, on the bad side, I mean, if you look at it, of course, risk sharing remains very low. Yeah, and now if you look basically at, of course, the factors that have kept this resilience, let's look at the positive factors. And of course, we, we will continue to quote it and it's saying all the time, but the, the policy response basically has been very important. And although initially, especially if you look at the fiscal response, it was basically across national borders. Of course, already the announcements and the fact that we communicated relatively quickly at the European level, for instance, for, with the NGU, the sure, I mean, that had had all an important effect in terms of ensuring that private uh, flows continue to flow. And indeed, if you look across the borders, we see really that different than the global financial crisis, private capital flows uh, across borders continue to flow. Now, one side remark, of course, on, on the ESM, as uh, this is an ESM conference, but of course, what we have seen also that no member state requested this ESM pandemic crisis instrument. Um, and of course, you may say that was good because maybe countries didn't need to resort to it. At the same time, you know, it is really something where we want to reflect further on, you know, how, how that stigma continued to persist in a way because it would have also been an important element for, for risk sharing during the pandemic. Now, where does it does this leave us going forward? No, so of course, uh, if you look, as I mentioned, the, the positive was we, we saw resilience in the risk sharing, but at the same time, especially on the private risk sharing, we have really a long way to go in the euro area, right? And, and if you look at, at, at US, basically the experience really there is that you have a more integrated capital markets, private risk sharing is very important in the overall share of, of consumption or income smoothing, right? And if you look in the euro area, when we did empirical analysis, I mean, you know, maybe 20% of, of the risks are, sh are shared according to our analysis currently in the euro area, 80% remains unshared, and that's a huge, Junk in the US risk sharing is much higher and private channels are really the most important in that. So really the way forward for the euro area, there's no way around it, I would say almost, is really this progress on capsule markets union and banking union. I mean, it's a key prerequisite for these private risk ch uh, sharing channels to work. And, and here on the CMU side, I mean, there's a lot of momentum and a lot of enthusiasm. I hope it will also translate into actual action. But of course, a key element is also post policies that foster this cross-border equity markets um, risk sharing across by equity is, of course, much more important in terms of, of, of risk sharing than debt because they are less likely to pull out of investments, basically, than, than debt investors. So here, of course, on the policy side, some, some measures can be taken, such as like tackling the debt equity back bias and taxation or, for instance, harmonizing insolvency rules. And also there is this proposal of a European single access point. And that should also help companies to attract funding across borders as it should at least simplify some of the rules, making it easier. Another element that is important and where we maybe can draw as a nucleus for, for a CMU, and, and that has come back already a few times in the discussion, is this whole green transition. Because when we look at the green um, side, basically, and green investment, for instance, euro area green bond market is much more integrated than the euro area bond market per se. So we look, for instance, at home buyers, and in the green bonds, it's half as high as in for your area bonds overall. So maybe the integration and having a kind of green CMU can, can serve as a nucleus, as, as a starting point for developing a broader um, CMU. But of course, while we need this private risk sharing, I mean, as I mentioned before, and it can substitute to some extent maybe for the fiscal um, risk sharing, it, 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 it cannot fully substitute for that. In fact, um, I would argue we need this fiscal insurance which is necessary to complement this risk sharing via uh, private channels. And I think there was a nice paper already some years ago by Emmanuel Fahri and, and Werning, which really shows that, you know, um, there is this market failure that private agents do not buy enough insurance because they're not able to internalize the externality of market stabilization and, and policy support can really provide this minimum level of shock absorption that can make sure that private agents are more willing to provide this private risk sharing. And so, in a way, for, for this private risk sharing to, to work, we need these public channels. And of course, here the NGU, and this keeps coming back, of course, as well in the discussion, has offered some interesting lessons, you know, about additional ways of, of, of fiscal risk sharing in crisis, right? And, and we should not underestimate it, because if you look at the announcements of 
this, the establishment to size and composition of the uh, recovery fund. And then together with you know, the press announcement of that already massively come on financial markets. So we really see this importance of, of this kind of instrument. But of course, you know, this, this is like a first step, right? So, I mean, we really need to move beyond that. And that's already what the two previous speakers have already said. So I don't want to necessarily repeat, but I can broadly agree with, with what they have said already. And I wanted to focus maybe because we indeed need to continuously discuss not only what is economically desirable and economically, we would of course say a central fiscal capacity would be the best way forward. But politically, that is a very difficult step forward. And for instance, making an NGU per, a permanent, although that would be, of course, maybe the ideal that we would say from an economist's point of view, politically, it's, it's very charged. And if you look basically more practically, what would one way forward would be with some sort, sort of joint capacity for financing public goods. And here, when we look, for instance, at the climate, the financing needs on the climate side, maybe this is really something where one can set up such a centralized capacity in the EU to finance this because it's really an example of a, of a public good. Now, just to close maybe on, on just the, the, the strategy review and how this strategy review has, has more or less reflected on this as well, um, you know, because of course it's it's key for monetary policy, you know, and it's not, it was not only in a strategy review that we have been saying that uh, the ECB has been saying for many, many years, the importance of, 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 of risk sharing uh, capacities in, in, at, the, at the EMU level. I mean, I'm, I'm can think about all the times that we have stressed the importance of banking union, capital markets union, and this was not new in, in the strategy review. Now, the strategy review, though, took more or less um, the current EMU ac architecture as given, because, of course, we focused on what can monetary policy in the current environment do, but, but to some extent or um, a small exception, let's say the fiscal side, because, of course, also there is a discussion going on on the fiscal rules. And, and you can also see actually more recently the, the governing council has also come out with a communication on the economic governance review and, and, and some recommendations there. And let's say, of course, the whole um, strategy review, of course, was a bit of an update for, of, the, of the existing strategy because it was 18 years since the last strategy review took place. And what has happened, and of course, the point was to make the monetary policy fit for the present day economic environment in which we operate. And here, a key element, of course, was this no low natural rate environment. And Lucrezia already alluded to it. I mean, it's, it's, of course, it has a key bearing on monetary policy, but also, of course, on how monetary and fiscal policy should interact, right? And so this, of course, brings to the fore even more the importance of the stabilization role of fiscal policy because of its effectiveness um, of, of fiscal policy when interest rates are near the lower bounds, right? And so, of course, this makes even more important this discussion about risk sharing on the public side as well. I mean, having um, basically not only a fiscal capacity, but a way to, to coordinate fiscal policy across the 19 member states not only from the perspective of, of, of sustainability, which was there in the treaty and which was also the original thinking, but also from the thinking of this need to offer some degree of stabilization, right? And of course here, the first goal would, as mentioned before, would be this central fiscal capacity. But an important discussion there as well, of course, is of how, how we can coordinate an aggregate euro area fiscal stance and having a discussion basically at European level of an, an aggregate fiscal stance. And I think the the, the, the EU area the EU governance review that is going on by the Commission is, of course, an important element during the discussion. Right? And of course, the pandemic has kind of shown this importance of this monetary fiscal interaction when, when uh, policy is closer to the to the lower bounds. And so it would be important that we learn from this experience and take it forward in, into the post pandemic period. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you for pointing out also the, the role that, in your view, then the private markets, private risk sharing can take and the need and the complementarity of banking union and CMU, but also making clear that um, private sector alone wouldn't do it. And we have also observed it here very clearly that public sector action is also very much needed in order to provide uh, support and provide trust uh, in, in crisis situations. Now, let me turn to the last speaker, to Matja Susek. He is head of policy strategy and institutional relations here at the ESM. Before, he was deputy uh, head of division in that same division. He is responsible for our policy works and uh, strategic policy direction, and also talks to international organizations and credit rating agencies for us. Uh, Matthias, 
from your perspective, we heard her, have heard about the different mechanisms that one can think of. How would you look at fiscal stabilization and at the ESM also as a possible mechanism in that regard? Thank you uh, very much, Rolf, and also thanks uh, to all the previous speakers. It's really, I'm enjoying uh, being part of this conference here with you, even though this time it's a virtual one. Uh, I will answer your, your questions, Rolf, and uh, by talking about risk sharing uh, in the Europe, in the Euro area as well. And uh, we have to acknowledge that since the establishment of the Euro area, much has been done indeed to increase risk sharing, to increase the resilience of the Euro area. And this was done especially after uh, the global financial crisis uh, about a decade ago. And, and, and we heard uh, also previous speakers acknowledge this. Uh, so we have today a stronger institutional architecture, but as we deal also with the consequences of, of the pandemic, we are again reminded of the need that more can be done, uh, in particular to be prepared better for future crises and also to strengthen this way uh, the European sovereignty. Uh, more effective cross-country risk sharing would go a long way to strengthen the euro area resilience and risk sharing, uh, as we heard today several times, also reduces uh, vulnerability to uh, external shock. And therefore, further work is needed to enhance both the private risk sharing channels, and we heard uh, today about uh, easing capital flows and promote capital mobility, as well as the public risk share uh, channels, which includes the public safety nets. So I will focus today on public uh, risk sharing. I will argue that uh, a euro area fiscal stabilization mechanism could be useful complement to the current economic uh, architecture in the monetary union. Um, this could help absorb shocks by complementing national counter cyclical fiscal policies and providing more fiscal space in economic downturns. This is especially the case for large asymmetric shocks where the monetary policy cannot help. We heard uh, that the monetary policy can run into the zero lower bound and also instances where national fiscal buffers may be insufficient to shoulder this burden alone. I will argue that now is the appropriate time to consider a fiscal stabilization mechanism for the euro area. And while there have been many proposals on how such mechanism could work, and I will detail them later on, one way to set it up quickly and efficiently, for example, would be to introduce a credit line that would not rely on additional resources. And this facility would not take the form of a common euro area budget, but would be a revolving fund, which could be drawn by euro area member states when experiencing economic distress. And in principle, the ESM could take such a role uh, since it's pretty much in line with this mandate and existing financial toolkit. And by putting forward this proposal, I hope I also address uh, the two requirements which were put forward earlier by Nicola Carnot about economic relevance and also political feasibility. Uh, so the starting point of my argument is that establishing a fiscal stabilization mechanism now under the current economic circumstances is more important than before. First, the public debt levels in some countries remain high and have increased even further uh, due to the much needed measures to tackle the COVID-19 economic consequences. As a result, the fiscal space in those member states seems to be more limited than in the past. And moreover, it will take time to rebuild fiscal buffers given the large spending needs that are foreseen for the future, for instance, among others, to support the green and the digital transition. Second, asymmetric shocks, which are crises that hit countries differently in different ways, could become more severe in the coming years due to climate change. Extreme weather events have become more frequent and the transition to a greener economy, which is inevitable, also can cause economic distress, it will entail fiscal cost, it could even have financial stability implications for the euro area countries. And uh, colleagues at TSM here are looking into these issues in more detail and will soon publish a paper discussing 
and elaborating more on these arguments. Uh, let me now discuss two important aspects of a fiscal stabilization mechanism. So first, regarding the economic design, most proposals for a fiscal stabilization mechanism for the euro area include the establishment of funds. We heard about insurance funds, rainy day funds, revolving funds. And these types of funds uh, vary by the degree of risk sharing and the mix between loans and grants uh, in the event of shocks, although uh, delineation between them can sometimes become blurry. For instance, some more recent proposals focus on the idea of establishing an insurance fund that creates some sort of a European unemployment benefit scheme. Uh, this would mainly rely on contributions, uh, financed through contrib uh, well, finance, it would be financed by contributions by the member states and it would disperse uh, grants. However, these schemes would require a new institutional architecture it would also take many years for them to become operational because contributions would need to be accumulated over the years in order to be able to disperse meaningful grants. Instead, to set up a fiscal stabilization mechanism as quickly as possible, we could think about a revolving fund that provides loans and not grants and does not rely on contributions. It could be operational within months and not years and it could use existing infrastructure, for example, funds that are already available at the ESM. No additional resources would be necessary. This would also ensure low condi loan conditions that are attractive to member states in the ESM benefits from a high credit standing and can borrow in the markets at favorable terms. Second, let's look at the conditions for the activation of the facility, and there seems to be a uh, consensus among academia that an unemployment trigger could uh, be used as a trigger event uh, to, to uh, disperse under the fiscal stabilization mechanism. And the rationale for this is economically sound. The unemployment rate is available at a high frequency and it is not often uh, significantly revised. However, relying solely on the unemployment rate to activate the fiscal stabilization mechanism may not be advisable. In fact, comparing trigger events that relate to the unemployment rate with recessions as defined by Eurostat provides a mixed picture. And we've looked into that and found out that in half of the cases, an unemployment based trigger would activate the fiscal stabilization mechanism outside of a recession uh, and would have missed 60% of recessions as identified by the Eurostat in the previous 20 years. Therefore, using unemployment indicators to trigger the activation of the facility should be at best a complement to expert judgment or alternatively could be based on more sophisticated indicators. So to conclude, let me summarize the main takeaways of my remarks today. A fiscal stabilization mechanism would be an important additional element in the euro area architecture to increase risk sharing and improve the resilience of the euro area. Now is the right time to set up the fiscal stabilization mechanism, considering the high debt levels in some member states, low fiscal buffers and the fact that climate change uh, could adversely impact financial stability in the euro area. There are many good proposals for a fiscal stabilization mechanism, which are economically sound. From an operational perspective, a fiscal stabilization facility designed as a revolving fund provides loans may be easier to set up, especially if this would be hosted by the ESM. Besides, such a solution would not require additional resources. Of course, different proposals are not mutually exclusive and several proposals could be implemented over time. So that sums up my remarks. Uh, the floor is yours, Rolf. Thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you for again pointing out to the benefits of a central fiscal capacity and also why ESM would be available uh, in terms of resources 
and legal possibilities and also operationalization of doing this. We have received a number of questions in the meantime, um, and please um, out there feel free to, in, in the audience, feel free to pose further questions in the, sh in the chat as we go along. But let me turn back to the panelists and um, put forward some of those questions. And first to, to Nicola, um, following up your, on your explanation, there were two remarks that came in that I would like to pose to you. First, how do you see the interaction between a central fiscal capacity, maybe next generation EU, and the stability and, and the reform of the stability and growth pact? Where are the ramifications here that go to both sides? What are the interlinkages? And also a second point that, as we heard, some of the discussion on the central fiscal capacity is also concerned, and you pointed to the need to avoid permanent transfers. That is also related to the question of risk reduction on the public balance sheet. So how can countries de-risk? How would you look at the European situation in that context and how we can we progress on that? Okay, thanks. Uh, I also enjoyed a lot the the discussion of um, the the complementarity between um, let's say a fiscal a central fiscal capacity and and the system of economic governance and and particularly fiscal rules uh, is a crucial topic. <laughs> it is uh, it is one that. I mean, the two should be thought together in a sense. I know we have this ongoing discussion of the fiscal rules, but ideally you should devise, you should think of the two uh, in tandem, uh, sort of. Uh, I would say that the interaction is both economic and in terms of, let's say, governance. In terms of economics, because uh, depending on you know, the kind of uh, stabilization that the fiscal rules allow, depending how they are crafted, uh, it may be more or less necessary to complement it, and the way you complement it should be uh, articulated, sort of. Uh, so the central fiscal capacity, in that sense, should really complement the national fiscal stabilizer and what is allowed under the fiscal rules. That's for the economic part. Also, in terms of, you know, the institutional uh, and the governance, I, I also see some kind of a link because, and there are different ways you can think of it. Uh, one is, you know, uh, conditionality, if, if this word can still be, you know, can you access the, the facility if you, uh, only if you respect the rules? That's an idea that has been frequently mentioned before. Perhaps this is or do you have the capacity as a sort of carrot in the medium term to the extent that, you know, you have some, some convergence some fiscal convergence paths uh, before. So, yeah, different ways to, to think about these, these complementarities. Um, yes, the, uh, can I add a, a quick word, uh, because maybe I will not be able to talk again <laughs> later on, uh, judging from the experience from the previous panel. Um, I, I, I would just like to to stress, I know it's a point that is often a bit delicate, but I think for me, the capacity is both for asymmetric, but also for common shocks. Um, I come back on this because I, uh, it seems to be a point that people, you know, stumble upon quite, quite frequently. I mean, if we talk about the aggregate fiscal stance, the need to complement the ECB, well, that may be because common shocks have asymmetric circumstances, but in my understanding, it's also uh, in order to, to, to help with the aggregate fiscal stance. And you don't really need a very large capacity to do that. You, you can make a start with not, not so huge resources. Then again, you have the discussions about uh, asymmetric uh, support, whether you do that through through the revolving loans of, of Matthias, which is an interesting idea, or whether you do you, you have to do more as in the second options that I underlined, but already this uh, this uh, notion of the um, discussing the aggregate situation, as also Lucrezia, I think, uh, mentioned, uh, complementing the ECB in certain circumstances uh, is, is important. Now, on the risk reduction, the, the other side of the coin, well, in a sense, I already answered, I think it has 
there is a complementarity again. Uh, you you have to to agree on some sort of fiscal certainty path. I don't think the panel right now is is the place to how exactly you craft that. You know this. Uh, that rule, how fast is this the national or the EU? But some kind of uh, of credible system has to be devised uh, in order to agree on that and to make sure that uh, it's uh, it's implemented. I hope this about answers it. Thank you very much. Um, with your explanations also on the SGP, maybe let me uh, turn here then. Lucrezia and, and um, ask you for your views um, on on the element of interaction. Um, but also one of the questions that was posed in, in the chat is what is the role of market functions and market discipline in all of this? And the way it's posed is what would happen if we let bond markets work freely um, and, and how can we look then at, at the situation? What more um, is actually needed? So maybe you you can react to what others said and to that question in in explaining further your views. Sure. I mean, uh, let me just give you a very general answer, and then uh, I will give a more specific answer. Uh, you know, there is there is this uh, thing that uh, you know, in order to sustain a high level of debt, we have to keep it safe, right? But uh, to keep it safe. Uh, you and to keep it safe, uh, you know, could take different forms. Okay, uh, the form that has taken in the last 20 years is that actually the real interest rate has been below the rate of growth of, uh, of the economy. So this is it means that there has been a safety premium, which has been something that government uh, have benefited, which has been something that governments have benefited from, benefited from. Okay, because uh, they enjoyed. Uh, this kind of form of synergy, if you want, okay, so translate it to the public sector so that, uh, you know, so it, only governments uh, can actually enjoy these very privileged refinancing uh, uh, conditions. Uh, uh, and this is because we think that public debt is safe. Now, of course, why do we think that public debt is safe? We think that public debt is safe because we think that uh, the government has the power of taxation, okay? so. To keep it safe, we need to, you know, keep the credibility. And this, in a way, is the general answer to that question. So that uh, uh, a government that uh, misuses its resources uh, and uh, and that uh, you know spend money for consumption, not for investment, that's Argentina. So at that end, uh, that becomes non-safe. So the kind of you know complicated balance uh, that uh, you know European countries, but not only European countries, will have to achieve, is uh, to keep the safety without uh, you know overdoing it. And you know there is a sort of laffer curve, if you want, of uh, of uh, uh, in, in that sense. Okay. So in a way, the way, the same way in which we think about seniorage for central banks, so you can translate that kind of discussion. To, to public uh, to 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 public uh, to public debt okay just uh, you know so uh, in the euro area this of course is more complicated because we have different uh, different countries which are facing different financing conditions and different uh, you know and different national debts so the question to me is whether we will be able to you know, navigate through the next decades with high level of public debt and new risk and so on uh, uh, without having at least some of that debt, uh, you know, becoming saved uh, through, you know, uh, through the, the guarantees, if you want, of, uh, of, uh, of the common fiscal capacity of the EU. And uh, I think that this is going to be the big question, because as we know, there are different countries with different risk profiles and so on, and whether we will be able to do it without uh, some new, you know, kind of ability to raise common debt, um, I have my doubt, okay? So I think that probably, you know, the next phase of the discussion is going to be, uh, you know, some mechanism that will create some more safety on the overall public debt of the union. Now, having said that, uh, don't think that the question of uh, uh, 
private risk sharing uh, is not related to the question of public risk sharing, because the reason why capital market union has not developed in Europe uh, is not only because we have only we have banks, uh, we have a banks based financial system, but is also because we don't have a safe asset. And as all the American banks operating uh, in Europe will tell you, without uh, a deep and liquid uh, market uh, for eurobonds uh, there is no capital market union so paradoxically you know we don't have uh, uh, you know uh, i mean we need resharing for both okay so you know this is going to be uh, you know the psychological barrier that we have to 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 jump at the end that's where we are going whether we will go there in the next 5 years or in the next 50 years i don't know this is mostly a political uh, issue but uh, we are not going to be safe without that kind of resharing. And you know, you can have all the financial and engineering that you want, but at the end, this is a question of uh, uh, you know of political uh, of political will. And uh, will that make the euro area a transfer union? I mean, there will always be that that danger. Okay, so that we will have to you know kind of uh, cope with that, with a mix of conditionality and carrots and sticks and so on. But at the end, you know, oh, that's what we need both for, for private and for public reasoning. Um, th thank you for sharing. I mean, the um, sharing is though <laughs> for, for sharing your views. Uh, but my, my take is that still some I mean, in before entering that that avenue, Many will looking will be looking for reassurances where where we will be going in the end um, and and how big the risks are. But in that regard, let me then also maybe turn to Isabel um, and let us hear your views on the other panelists, but also particularly on a question that was raised in the audience on do we need in order to move forward, do we need more convergence among member states? And we have heard about the impediments of moving to banking union, but maybe and, and capital market union, but maybe it's also good to hear from your side where you see the progress that we have made in the conditions for moving to banking union and more capital market union. So, I mean, your first question, do we need more uh, convergence uh, among measure states? I mean, of course. Convergence and, and having more similar economies in a way in, in the MLG union, of course, makes the job for everybody much easier, right? So, I mean, then the question is, of course, what is the necessary condition or what is the minimum level of convergence we need for, for the setup to, to work well, right? And I think part of that, of course, depends also on the willingness to, to, to share risks among, among the members, right? So, I mean, uh, uh, there, there's countries in, in the euro area where you know, regions have not necessarily converged very well for, for many years, but I mean, there's a political union and there's, there's a willingness for the country to, to, to stay together. And of course, then there's not so, ideally you would converge more, but there's not so much that debate ongoing. Then of course, the lesser that there is this willingness to have this risk sharing, the possibilities um, to, to have risk sharing across, across those regions. So of course, I mean, they are interlinked, right? All, all these debates and I mean, you know, um, it, it, is, it is a difficult balance to make, and I think Lucrecia already pointed right. I mean, it's the same discussion as, as, as what you were saying in terms of uh, market discipline. It, it's all about how much risk sharing versus risk reduction you want to see in, in, in the union. And I think this, this is the, the political debate that is going going and where one gradually shifts over time potentially and moves uh, as, as time goes by. But to finding the the optimal level or the right level, I mean, the optimal level would be that you have fully converged and you're, you're all more or less similar in terms of your business cycle and your, your level of, of, of GDP per capita. But of course, that is very difficult to achieve. And it's not necessary a necessary condition for, for the union to work well. But of course, you need some, some degree of convergence. And you know the, the degree that you don't achieve, you need to have some, some way of evening that out through, through other policies. And it cannot always be monetary policy, right? Where, which, which is, is then the, the solution. In terms of your question on the banking union and, and capital market union, well, I mean, on the banking union, I mean, we, we made huge progress at some point, um, you know, and it, it's becoming far away in our minds by now, but, you know, of course, the time when the SSM was set up, I mean, there was huge progress, but since then, 
we have really stalled, right? And I think the, the Commission tabled for the first time a proposal on EDIS already six years ago, and, and we have not seen much progress on that. And of course, um, I, I think this is really where, where we need some political momentum and, and, and will to move forward. I think for, on, on the economist side, we can all agree that it's important and it's it's really key. I mean, you just would like to hope that we don't need another crisis to move forward, right? So the, the really hope is that, that we can move forward there much faster. I think on the CMU, I mean, we see some pro uh, proposals being tabled. Let's see if they're actually resulting into to legislative changes in the member states. I think there the difficulty is really that uh, there's many, many small uh, proposals and, and, and to have this kind of overarching narrative on, on why why they are needed is, is, is more difficult. And I think we need more of a narrative in, in Europe on the CMU and what we overall want to achieve. Yeah, and Because maybe it's all these individual elements that are needed to create a CMU, but I think you know we lack this kind of overall narrative of, of what are the key factors there to, uh, to make it work. So I think this is basically the challenges um, that we see going forward. And otherwise, I mean, I think uh, I had the impression that on the panel side, we, we were largely in agreement with each other. So I don't think there were uh, major contrarian views. So I, I, I wouldn't have necessarily any immediate reaction towards, towards the other panelists. I think, you know, we really all see this balance between what we economically want to achieve and, and how to get there politically. And then, of course, you know, we can think of different ways of designing capacities and tools. And I'm sure as, as the economy evolves, we will we'll come with other ideas and proposals in that regard. But I think we all want to go more or less in the same direction. Thanks. Thank you very much, Isabel. Picking up on this point of convergence and stabilization um, that, that was mentioned, and also what you said before, there's one question on how to consider climate change aspects. Uh, Matthias, how would you see that operating uh, with an ESM tool, um, achieving structural change and convergence and stabilization, and what role you mentioned before climate change uh, could the tool have in that context? Well, uh, yes, that's indeed very interesting role. So uh, what we thought about is, you know, we, we are taking stock also from the pandemic, right? That was an unexpected uh, shock uh, to, to all the countries. Uh, it came up externally. It didn't come up as a result of, of uh, misguided economic policies in the past. So essentially uh, purely externally driven, and then it had uh, important economic consequences. In a way, uh, what we're seeing forward is that climate change could have this effect. It, it could there could be a shock. There could be a, a climate disaster affecting uh, some countries differently than others. Uh, uh, or there could also be there's also here the inevitable uh, transition to a zero carbon economy that will have structural implications as well. So it, it's very important here to consider under what circumstances then uh, uh, the fiscal stabilization capacity would disperse in these countries. And obviously here, as we have in precautionary ESM instruments, we have a number of eligibility criteria. It is important to say that the countries that benefit from this, they are sound, they are doing well economically, and they were doing well economically and they had market access when the, the shock has hit. So this is this is also an important, uh, let's say, certification or verification that that this we are using the right medicine, so to say, to address the issue that is there. And this also goes back to uh, uh, to the to the argument that that was mentioned here today, also about keeping it safe. So we also agree on the on the on the need to increase safe assets in the euro area that has many benefits. And coming back to the eligibility criteria, so by really using the right instrument to address the issue at hand, subject to a number of criteria, we are making sure that the, we are keeping it safe also on the asset side of, of the provider of the fiscal stabilization. And that is, you know, how we could ensure uh, uh, that, that the right measures are tackled. The second um, feature I want to mention with res respect to, to the climate change issue is the the maturity uh, of the loans. So the fiscal stabilization provides benefits through two channels. One is the cost channels. We mentioned that the loans can be given at favorable rates. The other is the maturity channel. So the loans can be given at, at longer maturity, uh, uh, let's say long 
as long as uh, the, the business cycle, not as long as the previous ESM loans, still this also is another a factor that generates uh, benefits and helps countries to stand up on their feet after the shock is gone. So these are basically the two aspects that I wanted to mention and we'll stop here uh, since we are about to close. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, this contribution and, and to be here with, with all of you today. Indeed, a big thank you also on my side um, to all of you for your for your contributions. I think, as Isabel said, there is indeed very much agreement on the panel that there is need for fiscal stabilization in conjunction with private stabilization mechanisms, even though we have progressed on in some of those areas when it comes to banking and partly to capital markets, but there is still a lot to be done. Um, and there uh, will, in any case, remain a role for fiscal stabilization as giving trust and as a complementary mechanism. So thanks a lot to all of you. With this being said, I would then turn over to Nicola Giammarioli for wrapping it up and concluding the conference. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, Rolf, uh, and also thank to all panelists uh, that contributed uh, to today's uh, discussion. Uh, as you say, it's now time to close this conference, which I hope you found interesting. We covered uh, a lot of ground, both time-wise. I think we went back to the sovereign debt crisis and what uh, we lessons we have learned out of it, and also the COVID crisis. We also uh, cover a lot of topics uh, from the institutional side, economic side, and the legal side. So in particular, in the first panel, I think we took stock of the progress uh, uh, we made in deepening our economic and monetary union in the past 10 years. We discussed how this progress has allowed the euro area to water the COVID crisis well. And finally, I think we share views on uh, which initiatives should be launched uh, to make further progress in the years to come in deepening EMU. In the second panel that we have just concluded, we discussed risk sharing in the euro area. And I would say, and all the panelists said, there has been quite a consensus among them on the issues at stake, in particular on the fact uh, that the fiscal stabilization capacity would make our currency uh, union more resilient. Uh, there was also a good discussion on the possible design uh, or, or, or the feature of such an instrument. Uh, all our speakers in both panels, I think, made a great effort to keep their intervention short and clear. So this conference, uh, uh, I think, has been accessible to a broad audience. Uh, this is precisely the purpose, our purpose, and also the purpose of the conference on the future of Europe, which is to nurture a pan-European public debate on the future of our union in all relevant policy fields. And at the DSM, we wanted to contribute to this debate by organizing this event today. We will also prepare a summary of proceedings, which will be submitted to the conference on the future of Europe to complete this process. So let me conclude by thanking again all participants, panelists, speakers, and uh, I can declare the conference closed and uh, I wish you a nice evening to all of you. Thanks a lot again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.